Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a little bit nervous, so if I speak a little bit slow and low, please forgive me. First of all, I want to thank everybody who just came out on this beautiful sunny day, because I guess most of you guys actually want to sit outside now drinking a glass of wine. Uh, but I actually want to thank the Bali first of all for actually giving this opportunity for an incredible group of people. Um, we have a beautiful crew coming from Zimbabwe, Ghana, Colombia, and Shihin, you're all over the place. Like, I, 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 you asked me to introduce you proper, but you are like a world citizen, right, a curator. Um, but also, I want to say thank you to Araba, Ofori, Aqua, Melain, Davy, Mondrian Fons, all the technicians, of course, Peter, Roland, Jasper, and Mondrian Fons for supporting this. Um, yeah, we're going to listen today to Shaheen, first of all. He's going to introduce every one of us uh, why they're here. And um, yeah, we're just going to sit down and hopefully learn something from one and each other. Because this Bilba Palace team is actually talking about storytelling. And these three people, actually, three groups I invited are for me the most incredible people I ever met during my travels, not only because they are intelligent, bright, beautiful, but also because they have something so special and so unique and the understanding why storytelling is so important, not only for themselves or for the community, but also how to connect with each another one over the world by doing what they're doing. And actually today we're going to see a little bit of their bubble, of their home, of their space. So I actually want to invite Shaheen to come up front. Shaheen, you like a person we met, when was it, 2015, even earlier? Like a long time ago. And right. yeah, and we did this incredible, uh, funny, but also important exhibition with also two artists who are sitting here in the crowd through Opelai and Femi Dawkins at Framer and Framed. And we started to get to know each other and since then, You've been taking me on a roll like through London and you, uh, incredibly, every brick you turn around or every tree you see, you have a story behind it. You know so much. You're like an incredible library, somebody with knowledge. I should have been a librarian. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize. Yeah. So, no, so, and that's why also I think for you to be here to have this incredible, yeah, schedule in front of us. Uh, we have some breaks also in between, so I think we start now and every hour we have another break for lunch, toilets, visits, just around the corner here. Um, but yeah, I think you are the best person to take this story and to work with it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. <laughs> so, um, welcome to everybody. Um, it's always difficult to start. Beginnings are not necessarily the best place to begin, but uh, let's begin at somewhere where I think which can help us to understand why Raquel is doing what she's doing, why maybe it's necessary for us to hear the people that Raquel has brought together. It is, at the end of the day, a, a diverse set of presentations by a diverse group of people. Here we have, as Raquel has mentioned, people from different countries, different continents even, who are, a couple of them, here in Europe for the first time. So the way that they will create a space for us might be very different to the way that we create spaces for ourselves. It's not a moment of translation that's necessary. It's a moment of humility. It's to be patient for others because they've been patient for us for a very long time. I'm interested in the notion of a gathering because we do a lot of that. And I think to a large extent, we're gathered here mainly because what Raquel has managed to do with her resources, 
and to create a sense of interest for us through those resources. We won't go into too many details about how this has happened. Everything is in the public domain about what Raquel does. But again, I think I should touch on what Raquel is to us and for us. We know her as a successful artist of late, who loves to travel, by the way. And when she goes to make exhibitions, and when she goes to her messy studio to make and prepare for these exhibitions, they end up in the most splendid of museums. But what happens between a studio and a museum or a gallery is what's interesting and what brings us here to think about the process of how an artist creates research. What is artistic research? Artistic research is not something that can be normally or is normally within the public domain. It's something quite private. And it's something which is also very relevant as we think about the efforts of artists in our time. Here we are under this one roof with the amount of different amount of stories which are going to be told. I know that the stories which are going to be told to us will evoke. They will evoke not only through Raquel, but they'll evoke for you, dear audience, maybe things which might be necessary, might be possibly uncomfortable, and could be actually create a space which is important to go through. When we open anything about ourselves, we to a certain extent also open our imaginary world, the spaces we occupy through that travel, through that making exhibitions or making public statements. But we've reached a very, very specific point in history, the history of the world. This history, to a certain extent, is an epoch. An epoch which has been realized through different cultures. In Hinduism, this epoch is called Kali Yug. Kali Yug means the age of darkness. Here, it is said to be the age of vice and misery. And it's mediated to a large extent through the goddess Kali. Others have called this the dawn of the age of Aquarius. Aquarius, in a sense, starts for many people in the 1960s. It's the advent of the age of Aquarius, where multiple planets met in an alignment and in a nodality with the moon. This constellation was called Aquarius. Others, more recently, have called it the age of information. Here, we both have access and denial and control of information. It's a period within the Western norm which looks at the relationship of information to public discourse. We find ourselves in these crossfires. Here we are at a crossroads. And as Hendricks would say, at the crosswinds. We are crossing a lot of bridges, ravines, we are also exhausted in crossing so much on a daily basis. The last time we saw so many people crossing the world on foot was in the Roman period. Recently, there have been some people who've been walking 20 miles a day for months to reach from Syria, from Iraq, from Iran, to come over to Europe. We have seen many and watch millions cross by foot. If their aches are not our aches at this particular point, then we're missing some point in our humanity. We watch the drownings in the middle seas and oceans for hundreds of years. 
We, watch the, we know of the drownings in the Atlantic Oceans, but we also know now of the drownings in the Mediterranean. We are also witnesses to the camps which have now become part of the realities of many of the refugees, where they cannot move out of, nor can they move within very easily. Here we are. Thank you very much for lining up my slides, which I should have been doing, but you have done it so well. Thank you. We are in a place where counter marches have become part of our reality and part of the images that we make and draw from. These marches are not only contesting atrocities, but they're also an eventual crumbling of borders. In the advent of new wars, we're experiencing more denser gatherings, greater commitments to new solidarities. And I will touch upon this a bit later. Here we are with a large group of young people exploring new solidarities, which even to those who are over the age of 35, seems glaringly different to what had happened in their lives. We are in a point transitioning between the heterogenetic, which is a gaze from the West, and its pronunciations, and its translations, and its examples of suppressing, wiping out, producing indignities, both historic and contemporary, towards a new phase, one hopes. So in this gathering today, what is important to understand is how do we allow this conception that Raquel has asked us to consider? What are the breaks that she will bring, has brought in front of us? What is it that has been forgotten, which is, remains incomplete, can be resolved by hearing the people who are here today? What is the further work that these stories will do for us which maybe we should have done in the first place. We have an unforgotten possibility of remembering now. Or if I, if I rephrase that again, we might have the possibility to realize the realities of Europe and Westernism through these people. Now, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go deeper into that. Because their narratives today, which we're going to experience, might seem like instances in our lives, but these are lives who have spent generations doing and creating their narratives. These are not new narratives, which we are going to hear. What they signal and touch upon is the colonial wound, which has never healed. What they signal is the faithlessness with which we've dealt blows to the indigenous cultures in the world. For the next few hours, our lives will be shared with people whose lives have been consolidated around these wounds, around their lives as indigenous cultures. And in the spirit of Documenta 15, which some of you might have gone, how do you stay in dialogue with each other? And dialogue in itself was an intentional title by Rang Rupa when they organized that an intentionality which proves that by sharing is, you find yourself in a fantastic, difficult position. But sharing can bring things, three things. Can we have the next slide, please? Oh, no, maybe before that. Um, no, 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 before. Can we go before? Uh, is that the only, all right, sorry. All right. Maybe I didn't make a slide of it, it was late. Sharing can bring three things. Sharing can bring a communication or forms of communications which can be about arguments and evidence. And I know there are arguments and evidence going to be made today by the three speakers. It can be persuasive. A good sharing, a good gathering can be very persuasive. It can bring an audience to their truth. And that's again, something which we need to think about. What is the relationship to whose truth? And hopefully, at the end of the day, 
we might feel engaged and even entertained to a certain extent by what is being said. I, for one, am a big fan sometimes of looking at something profound and important, not necessarily in the grand narrative, but in the personal histories of people. That notion of profound that is part of people's history can also be learned, let's say, from books. But you don't necessarily have to read the whole book from cover to cover. Sometimes one paragraph, one sentence, is the place of the profound. And to a certain extent, a postgraduate's research, uh, research doesn't have to be read from, page, from the first page to the last page. Evidence can be sometimes found specifically in one paragraph, in one chapter. The Indian writer and activist, and then we can have the next slide, please, talks about the idea or the notion of the great story. She has always suggested that great stories do not have secrets, that great stories are also have a profound connection to us where we want to hear them and want to hear them again. That repetition is something which is also very much found in the history of folklore. We should be in the place with great stories, with great comfort. They make you feel as if you're familiar with these facts which you might have not heard before. And the other space that she occupies, which is in the last line, you want to know it again. There's a place of repetition in a great story. The fact that in a great stories, we feel like we have to repeat it to others. And this is what's happening. Raquel heard things a decade ago. They have stayed with her. And she's brought them here to make sure that we also are part of what she had heard and what she remembers and it's her desire to make sure we also feel and understand why that was necessary for her. So we have two colleagues from Colombia, Sindra Tatiana Gonzalez Apuana. She is a contemporary weaver from the Wayu people and she is accompanied by Stefania Doria, a curator from Santa Marta, Colombia. If, I've, if you're still living in Santa Marta, you are, good, all right. And of course, we have Jonathan Dubé, also known by his clan as Sameta, and Araba, who has accompanied him here today. These four people are going to come in the next few hours be with you. First, Sindra at 3.30, and at 5.15, Sameta and Araba will be here to talk about the Shona tradition. Sameta is also, very interestingly, not only um, a shaman, but also works to um, initiate it and works in an art center. And the art center is called Zimbahete. Is that correct? Zimbahete? Exactly. Thank you. I always need to be corrected on some of my. Um, and the Arts and Culture Center, which is in Harare, in the outskirts of Harare, which is the capital of Zimbabwe. Um, has got two things happening simultaneously. And I want to talk about those two things as part of what we're going to, to some extent, feel today. And I'll do that when I talk f further on about um, Sameta's work. Could you tell me what the time is? Hmm? 
So let me just first talk about a tiny bit about, and I'm going to embarrass myself by using this word, Bill de Pellas. Say again. All right, you know what that is. <laughs> It's a really interesting concept, image makers, which is being used here. I would call them cultural producers. I would call them cultural practitioners. Image makers, to a certain extent, has a very specific limitation, which comes out of the tradition, a Western tradition, of what culture is, which is dominated. Um, what uh, Victor Bergen uh, calls by the ocular, meaning that image making is to do with the vision to see. Therefore, it is dominated by the eyes. Culture is not dominated by the eyes. We have sonic and we have healing as culture, which is what's going to be talked about, craft as a culture. What is happening to a certain extent is that, to a large extent, the worlds which are going to be explored, exposed by the, the people who are going to be speaking today, is not only necessarily about sharing stories, but it's about sharing their realities. These realities are elsewhere, to a large extent, for most of us. And they come at times like this, to these cultural ambassadors, uh, as not necessarily as ambassadors, but to speak about when they're allowed to, to make fertile our ground, and then they go away. How do we sustain the knowledge which they produce here for us today? How do they, to some extent, create from, the, from this informal space a greater space through which we can evaluate ourselves and the greater culture, which we are now, in a sense, facing. For instance, and I'm going to take a slight diversion here. I live in an area of London, which is predominantly Hindu. And being predominantly Hindu, it has a great amount of clusters of shops, restaurants. I have five temples around the corner from my house. I have two mosques, two churches. Most of the food which is sold in the nearby shops is connected to the moon cycles which are in India. Nobody knows that unless you are part of that community. To a large extent, what I eat actually is completely and directly connected to the farming community in Gujarat and Rajasthan. And the reason why I know that is because when I go to the shop and I see this amazing food being available, the answer I get, oh, it's not available. So I said, why is it not available when you're showing it like this? Oh, because it's the wrong season. So what is available and what is not available depends on the season in India, not in North London. At the moment, I just took this photograph three days ago. These are Kesa mangoes. They come either from Pakistan or from India. And an extortionate price of 17 pounds, that's around 20 euros. They used to be five pounds. This is the flux and flow of a global tradition. I can taste these mangoes only for the next fortnight before they run out. So my world is entangled with the seasons and the gardens and the places from which my food comes from. Although I might be living in North London or Northwest London, my world is completely dependent on, and what I mean by the moon cycles is that in Hinduism, which is based on the, 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 as Islam is on the sites of the moon, as recently Eid only happened when the moon, the new moon was sighted in Saudi Arabia, that means you can have the Eid. So this, what they cook is completely dependent on what moon is sighted when. 
that means that certain grains are available, certain foods, fruits are ripe. Now, if my life in Northwest London is guarded and guided and provoked by what happens with the Indian weather and the farmers in Gujarat, can you imagine the effects that ideas of faith, of religiosity, of culture affects the world? What are the flows, what are the effects globally of the generic spaces that we occupy through other cultures? Now, the decolonial, to a certain extent, which is what I want to get to, considers the art field and the world differently. It considers it through these flows as much as anything else. You have to understand that the world is differently made to be able to understand how colonialism and decoloniality works together or against each other. And let me try and explain that to you. When we hold an exhibition in a European institution, we expect the artists on the other side of the world to be ready to come into our, our calendar. We disregard their calendar. We don't think that that calendar or that part of that world might have something so important for them to deal with that they can't deal with an exhibition. We just expect artists to be outside of any other system apart from the art world. And that in itself is how we deal with a generic Western art world. Everything is built on your calendar and nobody else's. We think the world is driven by one calendar which is based on Basel, which is based on freeze, which is based on um, the season when it opens in September and closes in June. And between June and September, all artists of the world have to think, you have no idea that, you know, you just go, go out there and relax, you know, take your holiday. Because we're going to take our holiday, regardless of what happens to your life. Decoloniality asks us to evidence the patterns and the platforms and how they've developed. Regardless of the fact that June to September might be the prime time, the prime weather in another part of the world to move the artwork around. So one time I was moving because of the, the, the exhibition was in Germany, I was moving very, very amazing, beautiful collection of prints from India and they were boxed and everything very well and insured, taken to a port in the middle of the monsoon. Now, these prints are absolutely irreplaceable. Because of our desire to have the exhibition open in September in Berlin, we had to deal with those moving those prints in the middle of the monsoon, which is the most dangerous part to move in as a human body, let alone move prints in. And we nearly lost a precious collection because nobody thought about the fact that the other part of the world is a deluge. So let's follow that through. How do we face reality? Can we have the next slide? So, this is C.L.R. James, very important Trinidadian thinker and historian. He wrote under the pen name of um, various pen names, but one of them, they wrote, uh, he wrote under this pen name to, uh, about the notion of facing reality. And facing reality was the aim to regain control over their own conditions of life and their relationships to one another. It's a simple idea. It's a really simple notion. It's not asking too much for people to have control of their own lives, their own worlds. In many ways, what the rest of the world is having to deal with is a domination by unwanted historical forces, yeah? which not only rule over our resources, our calendars, our geo geological or geographical 
realities and materialities, but also the technologies through which we work and we think through. And what do I mean by the we is the global majority. So for instance, printing presses in the history of India were dominated by Germany. Most printing presses in India, everything that was printed in India at one time came from Germany, including the printers themselves, the printing machines. The early history of Indian printmaking is all printed in Germany and comes from Germany, and so does a lot of East African printing material comes from Germany. So the chronicling or the chronicles of early histories were not in the place where you thought they were. They came from somewhere else. Sometimes, like in Indian prints, the backgrounds to certain prints were not available from India, so they placed backgrounds from Germany on which were Indian gods and goddesses. And then they became part of realities of India. So Indian films even now are dominated by this vision enough to go back to Europe to create those backgrounds for Bollywood films. A lot of Bollywood films make, are made in Switzerland and the Alps, which are present in early Indian printmaking. It dominates to such an extent as an image, we talk about image making, that even today Bollywood films, the songs are sung with the Alps behind. So memory is ingrained, it becomes so much part and so much, it's, it dominates you in such a way because it is already distributed the, through the fields that we occupy as artists, as image makers, as filmmakers, as poets, as thinkers. Our attention, to a certain extent, is about how chronicling, or who are the chronicle, chroniclers um, outside of the colonial hold, which is still operative, which still operates from Europe and the Western world. What is said, what is spoken, what is uttered, what is opened, what is situated, what is possible? What are the horizons? How do we contemplate? What is the place of struggle? And how is another reality illuminated? Are all the things which we're going to try and work through today. It's a lot, all right? But in small, small bites, hopefully today, what will happen is you'll be able to understand through these people what needs to be done because they're already doing it. Yeah? Now, with struggle comes strength. And to a certain extent, strength brings current, the best practice out of many people. Irrespective of resources, a lot of people feel inspired by the strength they gain from others. And I know what Raquel has done for these people from Zimbabwe and from Colombia and from Argentina. It's going to be inspirational for them to carry on working for much longer. But hopefully, their realities now imbe are embedded here, not only in the Netherlands, not only in Amsterdam, but in Europe, and hopefully outside of the territories they already are operating within. Their lives have been about research, as much as the reason why we're sitting here, because this is the part of our research. Their lives have been about addressing authorities as much as our lives here are about looking at the place of authorities in our lives. Whether that's the authority of the art world or the art field or the authority that we see of other artists over our practice. We have to remember the artistic community itself is dominated by other artists who always seem to be doing better than us and we search for roots through them to better ourselves through. So there's always an originary investigation within the arts and within the research field. But our understanding here is that that originary tends to be Western. How do we allow others to occupy an originary place of understanding? How do we understand the realities of traditional arts 
which are very much alive and very much part of the world, as much as we have an understanding of oil paint on canvas. Now, conceptually, if we think about it, if we look at Raquel's work, for instance, we have an understanding, a conceptual understanding that she's demonstrated about what the Netherlands is for her. It may be a proposal or a proposition when we look at her work. But there's a lot of information in her work about the local community. There's also, to a large extent, a series of ideas presented through the, literally the, the, the materials she uses. She uses traditional materials, but includes, includes more and more a collage technique, which has been introduced. I'm really interested in Sindra's work and her weaving skills, but also the notion of patience through weaving. She comes from a matriarchal society, which none of us most probably have experienced. This is something new. Many societies traditionally were matriarchal. The matriarchal society had very different ideas about itself, the visions, its products. She has also created a sustainable, eco-friendly um, environment for 45 other craftspeople. This is a lot for one human being to do with the limited resources that she's working with. She has a business which is working, which she works through with multiple relationships, including spaces which are specifically important to a specific gender and is explained to the characteristics of that gender. Now, both Sindra and Stefania have a lot to talk about. We are all interested in the place of indigenous knowledge. There's a great amount of work going on about that in Europe and in North America. But their lives are actually also related to a pre-colonial time frame. The pre-colonial time frame is something which we know very little about because everything starts with the West. The intervention by the West starts the calendar, starts the recording, and then the pre-colonial is forgotten. The Wayu rebellions, which are very well known, started in 1701, in the 18th century. The Wayu were the first people to have used firearms and horses in that region to fight the colonial incursions which were coming through. This, these sort of complicated relationships in that region under crisis in the 18th century is still present in some of the works that they're doing now. And I hope that both um, Sindra and Stefania will be able to talk about not only pre-colonial histories, but the place of current conditions which is affecting that region, which includes malnutrition, government corruption, and mismanagement of resources. These are very important because these are not things which are just affecting, or conditions which are just affecting Colombia and Argentina. This is part and parcel of every person's reality in the southern world. Mismanagement, corruption, malnutrition is becoming every day. Now, I want to just quickly touch on, because what's the time now, please? All right, in the last 10 minutes, um, the second talks, the second talks by Sameta and Araba. Am I saying that correctly? The names, am I saying that correctly? Good, thank you. The place of arts and faith. Now, Sameta is known as Sameta by his clan. His other name is Jonathan Dube. Sameta is a shaman. 
it's not very often that we sit amongst shamans in the West, in the urban centers, especially of the West. The shaman for an artistic community, and don't laugh about this, was Joseph Boyce. Don't feel awkward about it, Femi. Um, the second shaman was Herman Nish. Now, Boyce and Nish were both artists and shamans. And the reason I bring that about, because there is a bridge relationship between contemporary art and the relationship to belief. Um, a number of artists in the Dadaist and the Surrealist community had a similar relationship to art and belief. There is actually a movement now um, which is res resurgence through Helma of Klimt, looking at her work, her paintings, and the relationship between belief and modernity, the start of that. The place of the shaman, as I said, in urban society is, has been mediated by an invention, an intricate invention, in a sense. Boyce often lied about what he did and what he was to create an intricate exploitation of the gaps because we had a lack of sensibilities around shamanism. The spirituality that existed around Boyce was about a venerated German figure in, the, in German modernity, after post-war modernity such. It's not that the space of shamanism has been reduced to a, a form of um, totalizing by Boyce or Nietzsche. There are also assumptions with shamanism to do with uh, the use of herbs, drugs, um, out-of-the-body experiences. And of course, at the moment, and I hope this is correct, ayahuasca, is that a correct pronunciation of that, is undergoing a kind of a, a treating, uh, people are looking at it in a decolonization, in a, in a process of decolonizing that, that use of this particular drug. Can I have the next slide? I think it's got a quote on it. Yeah. So here we have another way of looking at an aspect of shamanism and the way that, to a large extent, we can think about how the collective polycrisis is being dealt with through certain drugs and through certain ways of creating visions. What I understand from what I'm looking at is that we're working with diminishing resources to deal with this polycrisis. And we need new tools to be able to address the world as it's effectively unfolding before us and for our children and for our next generation. The existential problems which are in the Western world and in the Northern world have become global. Do we, in a certain way, or are we turning to a certain way, and this is a question and a proposition, are we adopting ancestral voices to try and glean some sort of information which was in the Middle Ages or in the Middle Passage? Are we su suggesting the forms of rituals which are reenacted outside of the, the Western have still the ability to teach us about spirituality, which to a certain extent is less and less available as a resource? Now, Sameta is going to talk about the Central African perspective from a landlocked region of Zimbabwe. We're double blessed in a sense because he will be also talking about the role of shamanism or the role of treating, caring, of well-being, which have become very important for a younger generation to come through at a time of this polycrisis. More and more, those very simple factors are the factors which are drawing 
young artists, young creatives, young activists to think through how do we cross this bridge, this polycrisis bridge. What Sameta is going to talk about is not a counterculture of Zimbabwe, because well-being and care is a counterculture in Europe at the moment. What he's talking about, and what um, I think Zimbabwe, the art center, does, it forms a core through which shamanism and art, or art as shamanism, or art that delivers the shamanistic vision to its public is going to be, is practically and materially realized. How does an art center function today? It's not the same way an art center or resource center in the, in the West functions. And I'm using a quote here that he has suggested it stimulates growth. It stimulates transformation. Growth and transformation is what we are also looking at, not only as policy, but as a reality. These registers which are coming from these different systems outside of the global West, um, from a global cap capitalism, um, are really important because, as I said, and I return back to that timetable, which is now Basel is in Hong Kong, so Hong Kong is known as Basel Hong Kong. Now that freeze is in Seoul, now we see Seoul as freeze Seoul. When we have that um, suffix, they call it a suffix, the first, you go by the first name, freeze Seoul, Basel, Hong Kong, you realize Hong Kong as something to do with Basel. And Seoul has something to do with freeze. It's a mechanism. It's a tagging mechanism. It's a breeding ground for how we view the grand expansion, similar to the grand expositions in the Victorian times. I'm not sure if the questions I'm raising here are going to be exactly raised by the speakers, but they're worth at least raising up because we're dealing with a great expansion going on and a great amount of advocation why culture and art especially is an investment. Most artists believe art to be an investment. And the heritage of the rest of the world has become part of the investment. When I was recently uh, curating the Uganda Pavilion at Venice, everybody was looking at the exhibition as a possible venue of investment. So the structures such as the Biennale itself becomes a gambling zone on artists' careers. We are facing direct challenges of what is culture, what is art, what is contemporary. And I think in that, we call this a worlding. What worlding are the speakers going to be able to offer is really interesting. Now I'm going to end here because I think I'm going to run out of time. I just want to bring in one tiny little, um, tiny bit of information. I think what Raquel has done here is an act of sly civility. And the reason I use that term is a notion coined by the Indian art historian Homi Baba. And it's important to recognize what sly civility means. It's an, it's an exploration of disobedience. And in that sense, it's also a rejection of other societies and other possibly colonial expansionist demands. I, I, I recognize in this room at least four artists who are involved in sly civility. In sly civility, what is important to understand is that they don't give feedback to the colonial project. The colonial project can only resolve itself when it gets feedback. 
when there's a response to coloniality, when you undermine the authority of colonialism as it exists within the canon, you are not giving it feedback. Instead, in that refusal, you can do many things. You can address it through this sly, uh, sly civility, or as Glissant, Edward Glissant, the Martinique philosopher said, you can hide. You can get away from this. You go underground. You ruminate somewhere else outside of the colonial demand. The place of such events as this conversation, some of the exhibitions which I've been through, even today I went to an interesting exhibition here, um, and the publications which are coming around, sometimes they deliberately use the ploy of hiding what they are producing. They would produce a small, let's say, publication of a limited amount of 100 or 200 for their community. Although that piece of publication could very easily sell a thousand, they deliberately use it to get to those 100 to 200 people that this is a recording. That, to a certain extent, is a decision made by an artist, by a group, to make sure um, that the right people get the message. David Hammonds, the American artist, did a show, um, I think it was at, uh, I think it was at the MoMA, for his teacher, Cedric White. And he showed two pieces of work. He showed his teacher's work in this room, and he showed a piece by Leonardo da Vinci. Two pieces. He produced one poster, no publication. In doing that, American society realized that Cedric White was a really, really important artist and gave him a one-person show retrospectively within the next six months. It's an act of civility, sly civility, to be able to produce one poster to an exhibition with two paintings. But it was David Hammonds. So what I'm going to say, last and not least, knowing ourselves in this way, knowing what we're going to hear today, is not cultural exchange. It is an inspiration that we need to acknowledge with patience and in, in the way that is meant to be, to gather and understand what is about to unfold. So I hope you stay for the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everybody. Um, oh, it's a nice new face. It's good. Um, yeah, so first, Shaheen, thank you so much for your beautiful talk. And I think it was a perfect introduction to what we're actually going to experience from now on. And I'm sitting here with two amazing, beautiful, gorgeous women, super strong, and being an inspiration for me for some time already. Um, the only thing what we're going to do now is that we're going to translate everything into Spanish again, so also Sindri can uh, talk a little bit about her practice and life, and also, yeah, why. I don't know if you want to translate already, or I'm just talking and... So I think I'm going to start with a small introduction how I actually met these two amazing women. And a few years ago, I started to travel through Colombia to do actually a 
a sort of research about female social leaders, because at the moment there's a lot of women in Colombia who actually are focusing on communities, helping communities um, with money, bringing children to school, make it more safe on the street and so forth. And Fia Fia, a friend of mine, we actually ended up at Sindri. And she is doing something amazing I haven't seen before so far and so powerful is that she understands craftsmanship in her community, the Woyu community in La Bahira in the northern part against Venezuela. Um, and because she understands the history and the power of that, um, she wants to show it to the world as the community, the Woyu community in Colombia uh, are actually very much struggling now, politically, um, but also when it comes to resources, most of the time there's no water and whole villages will stay without water or money for months or weeks. Uh, but because of her craftsmanship and because she understands how she can unify women in the community, uh, she actually started her own company, let's just say a foundation company, where all these women are coming together and via weaving, via really old school craftsmanship, she is actually talking about her cultural heritage and uh, trying to bring the community back together. Um, and also, Stefania, uh, as a curator and working with a lot of artists, students, you've been like one of the best persons now on this road and also as translator, we've been going through an incredible couple of adventures where people were shooting while sleeping in hammocks outside, still like almost getting lost and <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> uh, but I actually, first of all, I like you guys to maybe talk a little bit about your practice, uh, to just give you guys the first few words about what you guys are doing and why you guys think also why it's necessary to be here. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you for being here. Um, first of all, um, I think it's necessary to make something uh, really important to Sindri and her community. Her Wayu community, as Raquel said, this is the north side of Colombia. It's a desertical place uh, with different and tough conditions, um, but full of culture and many things to tell. That's the reason we are talking about storytelling. So uh, Sindri uh, needs to do a, a little ritual to start out this conversation and ask to her ancestors to everything goes right and everything flows in the best way ever. So, Sindri. Hola. Yas hota ya ya ya. Mauru. Ya hasta im tu takuai paka mus kasain tu teinainkan. Tanulia Sindri González teiruku ipuana tu teika ipuana. Chitashikai Gouriyu, Tayakat Sindri, Tatiana, González, Ipuana, Gouriyu. Tu hapuna ka hapa ka tapa ka humu pushwa e. Si atu su 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 puta ka wamu e. Tra waikat wojikat wareker. Tu spura anay hatun wakuai panohrin kurahan e inay hatuai wanepi. Anaña hat hukuaipa y acá no puso. Ya terminaste todo. Yo lo tengo acá. Every step we have taken is a threat woven into our life. Truly re re reflecting our journey, especially when I hear stories that I will never forget and learn more about our ancestral generation to answer questions that I had a few years ago. My name is Sindri Gonzalez. My mother is from the Eriku Upiana, Ipiana clan, 
and I'm from the Eriku Ipuana clan. I am the daughter of Goriyu because my father is Goriyu. And I am the granddaughter of maternal grandparents from the Ipuana clan and paternal grandparents from Goriyu and Epiu clans. This bracelet has been given from uh, has been given to you is a legacy from our grandmother's wa grandmother Waleke and reminds us the re relationship with nature. This bracelet gives us energy to desire to weep, eliminates laziness, uh, activates creativity, and is given to you without the love from the women artisans from the Wayu culture. I hope Say? Okay. Oh, ta, ta, ta point is muy, Anaya Watts is muy, Raquel Van Haver, de Bali. Ustedes los que están aquí, el público. Oh, ta, Estefanía. Eh, Merli. Merli. Anaya Watts es muy, Pushoy. Ya podemos comenzar. She wants to thank you to Raquel for being uh, the, the magical women behind of this project. Uh, also to Merli and me uh, for, her, uh, for the unconditional support and all the people who is interested about her culture. So let's start. Thank you. <laughs> so um, thank you, first of all, for your beautiful words. But why we're here is we talk about storytelling. I've been, we've been experiencing a lot of stories together, uh, but also in conversations, what we had before was like, how can we actually put our stories out there, fear cultural, fear heritage, fear craftsmanship. And I think to understand for people who never been connected to the Wayu community is that it is actually a community that is like really carried by women. And I actually want to start about with that women dreaming and craftsmanship as something also that protects the community. So can maybe elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, to ask her about the, the community? Yeah, and female lines, the bloodline, the weaving, and that women really carrying the community self. Okay. Sindri, entonces quiero que hables un poco de la comunidad y de cómo se relaciona el tema de la comunidad del tejido y el tejido. Bueno, eh, nuestra comunidad eh, está ubicada en Colombia, los cocos Alta Guajira. La cultura guayú, la, la cultura guayú es totalmente artesanal. Eh, nuestro origen lo explica el tejido guayú. Eh, somos una comunidad que a pesar que tenemos muchas riquezas manual y mucha riqueza este, espiritual, mitos, leyendas, es una comunidad que también pasa muchas dificultades, muchas dificultades sin los servicios básicos. Yeah. Well, the, the first is the hair community is located in La Guajira, it's called Punta Coco. And the women is extremely relation uh, has a, an extremely relationship with the with her community uh, because as you see in the back, uh, well every single back and every single uh, women thing is uh, means like a a special part of her community. So uh, she's trying to explain us how is living between all having all this knowledge and resources, but also trying to survive in these conditions and situations. Para llegar a mi comunidad, Raquel, Estefanía, que me acompañaron, estuvieron que pasar horas por carretera. Es de difícil acceso. Para es la excusa que ha tenido el gobierno colombiano para no llegar a Punta Coco y ayudarnos, ayudarnos con toda la parte de las dificultades que tenemos este, de, servicios, de servicios básicos. Sin embargo, nosotros como cultura eh, somos resilientes, somos una cultura resiliente y salimos adelante a base de nuestra 
economía, que es muy importante, la tejeduría guayú. Takes hours to arrive to her community. You have to drive into the desert. There's no road, so if the the rain falls down, it's impossible to cross. It takes like I don't know, almost four hours to the closest town, and that's the excuse for the government to never arrive there and help them with the basic basic, basic things that they need to. Uh, preserve and keep the community uh, working on. But they are a really resilient uh, community. They are trying to keep the, the knowledge and also the wisdom around the women uh, to keep the, the community uh, close to the, this kind of uh, believers. And uh, the, the women is always something that helps the community to survive in the, in, into the, these situations. So uh, what you're saying already, like the foundation, you as well, especially you, and we met some really beautiful other activists, artists also when we were uh, there. The the knowledge you want to preserve, I'd like to talk a little bit about that because this, this thing is about mm -hmm. storytelling and storytelling in the Wayu community is extremely important. Like also with like the clothes, with like also like all the signs, also with the bags. So the, the, the community exists already for ages. It's an old community. They travel. They're nomads going from Venezuela to Colombia to the islands and forth and back. So can she tell us, or oh, maybe talk a little bit more about how the, this preservation works, how she keeps the stories there? with the youngsters, with the old people, because like I know we've been talking mm -hmm. and we've been like, everybody likes to share these kind of stories, but it's one of the few places I've been that really understands how important this storytelling is to keep the community in place. Bueno, eh, Raquel estaba hablando un poco como de que la comunidad Guayú pues se, se, caracteriza, se ha caracterizado porque han sido nómadas y se han movido por diferentes lugares. Eh, que ustedes siempre tienen como elementos históricos, eh, elementos como claves de, para contar historias con su vestimenta y demás. Entonces, lo que quiere saber Raquel un poco es eh, cómo hacen para que estas historias mantengan unida a la comunidad, cuáles son esas estrategias para mantener unida la, la comunidad alrededor de las historias guayo. Bueno, este, la cultura guayú es netamente oral, uh -huh. no es escrita. Escrita en lapicero, pues en colores, no. Es totalmente oral nuestra manera y es muy simbólica. Okay. Oral, sí, sí. simbólica. Eh, y eh, the guayú culture is an oral uh, culture, so there's nothing in in, in a text. Uh, is created by colors and symbols, uh, and that's the reason that you you maybe you won't find a, a book about them. Oral la mantienen nuestros abuelos, nuestros ancestros, nuestros mayores. Ellos son como el libro para nosotros, los libros. Y la manera simbólica son nuestros tejidos, okay. nuestros, te o sea, donde esté grabado el canazo, tejidos, toda la parte de tejeduría, toda la parte de, de, de totumos, de, en piedras, o sea, en eso plasmamos nuestros, sim hasta en nuestros animales, plasmamos nuestros símbolos. Ok, so all this wisdom and the information about the culture is kept by, by the grandparents, so uh, they are like the books for the community. Uh, they teach the others uh, what they have to believe or how the, the nature work in them. Uh, and the other part of the, of the wisdom of the Wayu community is the women, because in, into the weaves they, they print uh, the meanings of the, all the nature around there. So that's the reason the women uh, is, is a really important part into the communities. Les voy a dar un ejemplo, ya que tenemos aquí esta mochila, este, que, que de pronto para ustedes, Occidente, 
o Ali, Arijuna, como decimos nosotros, es, es una pieza más de, de la moda, un accesorio. Para nosotros, la, lo, la comunidad Guayú, no. Para nosotros, esto es, o sea, es como un libro sagrado, relacionándolo. Esto referencia, cada, o sea, cada vez que nosotros, o yo como mujer Guayú, tejo, comienzo, es, es, es como relacionar la vida con la muerte. Es, es recordar nuestro origen como cultura guayú. Es recordar toda esa sabiduría que nos dejaron nuestros ancestros. Y es la manera que nosotros como mujeres, y sobre todo las mujeres, tenemos eh, la responsabilidad de preservar to toda la riqueza ancestral. So she she wants to give uh, give you an example of this with this bag because maybe you think that is just an object and maybe something uh, an, a fashionist uh, subject, but for them it's more than that because all these uh, patterns that you can see there means uh, something about the nature, uh, something about the ancestors. Uh, so uh, for her. As a woman, as a weaver woman, uh, woman um, means that it's something that you have to keep with the new generations to keep the message alive. Cuando nosotros iniciamos un tejido, o sea, nosotros los los guayú nacemos, pues eh, recordamos la tierra. Nosotros como cultura guayú tenemos un origen diferente que se clasifica en cuatro etapas. El inicio de nuestra vida lo, comienza, lo referenciamos como cuando comenzamos el tejido. Uh -huh. Y va subiendo, va subiendo, va subiendo, va subiendo, va subiendo. Son los años que nosotros pasamos. Cada, cada, cada puntada que nosotros tejemos es como un día. Uh -huh. Es como un día. Entonces, en eso vamos recordando este, en el tejido. Cuando nosotros terminamos, que es la parte de arriba, es cuando nosotros morimos. Okay. O sea, en, nuestra, en, nuestra, en mi cultura, cuando llegamos y morimos, vamos arriba donde están los dioses, o sea, nosotros uh -huh. nos volvemos este, prácticamente uno, unos dioses también, o sea, hay otra vida después de la muerte. Ok. So, uh, all this cultural system work in a, in a special way because when they start, uh, the women start uh, weaving, the bottom of the back make, means uh, when you are, uh, when you were born. And then you start threatening and threatening and weaving and weaving like the life, like flowing with the life. And the top of the back is, uh, means that uh, you will be a part of the heaven. You will be a part of the goddess and gods. And that's the reason that when the, the back is sober, it's, it's like a, it's something that you are giving to others to remember that thing that you have to born and then die and and then go to this spiritual vision of heaven. Este dibujo eh, que plasmé en esta en esta mochila, eh, nuestros ancestros nos dijeron que eso eso se llama marriunaya y significa como el grabado que se le hacen a nuestros utensilios, se llama totumo. Mm -hmm. eh, exactamente. Okay, this pattern, this special pattern is called uh, como el grabado del totumo is like uh, the way they print, uh, uh, they have like a special cups made by, by uh, a material that uh, is from a, a tree called totumo that you will find at the Caribbean side of Colombia. And also in the, in the desert, they use this, cal, uh, this kind of cups Uh, to drink a special uh, drinks. Um, they have like a distilled alcohol made by the, all the cacti you will find there. And uh, they used to print, uh, to, to draw in these cups uh, and a special thing of the, uh, a special and different things of the tree. And uh, this pattern is inspired by the, this in this uh, tree and the, the, the drafts that they used to put on the, cu on the cups. Este, todavía, vamos a seguir hablando de la mochila. Bueno, entonces, <laughs> yeah. ya que tengo el ejemplo aquí vivo, eh, si ustedes pueden, me pueden preguntar, ¿verdad? 
If you want to ask something, be free. Bueno, este, nosotros nos inspiramos en los colores de la naturaleza. Todo, o sea, es, la figura se llama kanasu, es la máxima expresión del tejido guayú. Esto se puede plasmar en mochilas, en chinchorro, en todas nuestras, en, en todas nuestras artesanías. Y eh, Colombia la declaró, o sea, las figuras solamente es de la cultura guayú. Más nadie en el mundo puede hacer esto porque esto es de mis ancestros. Esto es de mi cultura, de mi comunidad. Y eh, Colombia lo declaró como patrimonio inmaterial de la humanidad. Solamente le, lo puede, porque hubo un tiempo en que este, la comercialización decían diseñado por tal diseñadora. Esto es de la cultura guayú. Ok, uh, if you see these patterns, uh, these patterns, um, patterns are uh, into a big system of patterns that they have called Kanazu. Uh, so she's trying to explain us that for her community it's so important that the Colombian government declare all this way of weaving uh, like a uh, um, origin denomination. That is something that just the Wajú community can can do uh, because they have like a few problems with designers in Colombia that they try to use these patterns uh, and try to commercialize them and sell the, by their names. But it's something uh, right now is uh, the laws protects this, uh, these women and uh, that's a huge, a big step for them. Bueno, este, seguimos con la mochila. El cordón es, es inspirado. Mira, esto para, para hacerlo se, tienen que, se necesitan dos personas, una sola persona no se puede. Y es inspirado en la cola de nuestros reptiles. La borla eh, está este, inspirado en la riqueza que tenga la familia. Entre más, yeah. más mejor. Y esta gasa es paleteada, o sea, es, se hace en un telar. Ya. Yeah. Uh, well, the the first part of the the lace of the the um, the bag is made by two people. It takes like a, almost uh, three weeks to do this. And uh, if you see this part, it means the the how rich is the the clan or the family who did it. And uh, if it's bigger, uh, means that you are more rich than others. Uh, it's something to presume, you know. So, uh, and they uh, they use like another technique with this because they need like a teller and all the uh, like the traditional system that in Western you know the, uh, of women is kind of, uh, but it's totally different than the rest of the back. Bueno, este, la relacionado con, pues, con la mochila. Esta manta que yo tengo puesta, totalmente hecha a mano, en un telar. Con esta técnica se hace el chinchorro guayú. Nosotros los guayú nacemos en un chinchorro, morimos en un chinchorro. Okay. Eh, el chinchorro nosotros, para nosotros significa como la placenta de la mujer cuando está embarazada. Para nosotros significa eh, eso. Esta es la técnica del cayurense. Okay, if you see the long dress that she is wearing, called manta, uh, the technique that they, uh, she used for this is the same technique as the guayu hammock, but the real name is chinchorro. And the chinchorro is so important for the community because they were born there and also they die there. So, uh, well, if you see, it's all handmade and using the, 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 the typical materials that they have to for the, for the bags and also for the hammocks. Thanks. What I actually know, so what, what Shein was uh, pointing at before is that the symbol, symbolic uh, importance of everything, what you do everywhere. Um, what you see also in the clothes, in like, everything, the like jewelry, uh, cups, you have symbolic details, visual details on it. And it preserves and it keeps the story within within a community and it goes via like talking, storytelling, oral ways, songs into the next generation. And my, uh, my curiosity is because 
how do you uh, continue the stories? How do all elder people come to, to sit down with younger people? How, in what kind of way do they transfer these stories? Because I know we, the first time when we were sitting uh, so a few years ago, we were talking about that a lot of young people now actually going to Santa Marta or they're going to Bogota to study. A lot of young people don't want to live there anymore. So we actually now see a gap happening also because there's a lot of people from abroad, uh, Chinese delving, illegal mining. It becomes more difficult actually. So the importance more to keep also like with like all the symbols, everything in the clothes, it needs to be there, but also how do people read it now as the yeah, mm -hmm. knowledge becomes... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Raquel, basically what you want to say is that she identifies that you carry with many symbols, tanto in the clothes, as in the mochilas, eh, y que cada cosa pues significa algo, es como todo un sistema, pero eh, la, la pregunta va más a cómo llega esta información, esas nuevas generaciones, cómo la leen ellos y cómo están haciendo para que eh, pues la entiendan, teniendo en cuenta que muchos se van, estudian afuera o que está todo este influjo de, de la globalidad. Bueno, nuestra manera de cuidar nuestra simbología y toda nuestra riqueza ancestral es por medio de enseñarle a nuestros hijos, o sea, nosotras las mujeres. Es nuestra tarea, es nuestra labor, es, es, o sea, para nosotros en estos momentos es una preocupación este, bastante, bastante vital para nosotros las mujeres, es preocupante que así... Como en la época, me acuerdo de, bueno, me acuerdo un poco, no era de esa, pero sí este, en la época cuando llegaron los españoles a nosotros, prácticamente como que o, o hablas español o hablas español, o, o, o te vuelves de esta religión o te vuelves de esta religión, y nos tocó como que este, dif, eh, cambiar nuestras cost muchas costumbres, pero este, gracias a, a, a a nuestros ancestros, eh, las mujeres guayú, estamos eh, en, ese, en esa tarea, en esa labor de pasarlo a, a nuestros hijos. Well, she, uh, she says that right now is a, a little bit hard because all the situations are around them. But uh, all this knowledge and all this wisdom, uh, they try, the women have the all this challenge to keep a uh, generation by generation uh it is all about this ancestors no yeah, they uh, the women understand the importance of having this on mind and trying to preserve uh, every single year so they try to teach to the the all uh, the, the the new generations, all the customs, the old customs uh, about the community. Por lo menos esto que estoy haciendo yo hoy aquí y yo le agradezco a Raquel que nos abra estos nuevos espacios porque este, de alguna manera nuestra voz tiene que salir de la comunidad de alguna manera este, para que conozcan nuestra verdad que no es, no es la que se ha, ha publicado tan amarillista sobre las comunidades indígenas. Nosotros este, tenemos un pensamiento diferente, sí. Pero es nuestra manera de ver, la, de ver nuestra vida, de que nuestro origen lo vemos diferente. Nosotros estamos muy conectados con la naturaleza. Para nosotros es la naturaleza no es un árbol, no es la, para, para nosotros es, eh, son nuestros mayores, son nuestros ancestros, son como personas que nosotros por eso de pronto conectamos tanto las culturas indígenas con con la naturaleza, porque no lo vemos como, como, como simple, sino que lo vemos como nuestros abuelos. De... Dale. Uh, well, uh, this is a, a long story, but uh, well, it, they, they, they see that nature is in everything. So they try to, to keep this, this message alive because it's the only way to to keep the balance between the the the, the, the heaven and the earth and also she's so thank you uh, it's so grateful with raquel because uh, to uh, to the community has been really tough 
to tell the real story or the real meaning of the of, of being with you because the press and the Colombian media, he, they are always talking about the indigenous communities the wrong way. They never try to find the real stories and tell the stories from the, the inside the communities, just this Western uh, way of think. And also she's, uh, she said that, uh, she said before that the religion, the religion, uh, Catholic re religion try to banish all the customs and all the way they, they are living. So being in this place, talking about the, the, the community and talking about the ancestors and talking about the, the importance of telling the stories from the, uh, with their voices, not, not from outside. Eh, means a lot for her. Bueno, esa es una forma, o sea, como le venía diciendo las mujeres, pasar la sabiduría este, a nuestros hijos. Y eh, otra muy importante son los sueños. Para nosotros la cultura guayú es muy importante porque mediante los sueños fue como el primer, la primera etapa de nuestra creación. Y todavía, o sea, todavía nosotros recibimos información. Es la forma de comunicarnos nosotros Guayú, o sea, hombre, mujer, niños, con nuestros ancestros. Cuando te hablo de ancestros, no te digo las personas nada más. Uh -huh. Te hablo del sol, de la luna, te hablo de la tierra, te hablo de todos animales, plantas, uh -huh. porque ellos nos hablan en nuestro, como te digo, son como personas y nos hablan me, mediante los sueños. Okay. Well, uh, as she said before, uh, that uh, they are trying to keep this message with the new generation and their kids. And also, uh, the dreams are really important for the Wayu community because they receive message from the from the ancestor them. Uh, in their dreams, they they had uh, all the information about the, their creation, the where they they are uh, where they were from, uh, they come from, and uh, also. They receive message that uh, about how to act in in every situation, and uh, the dreams are the way they try to to be connected with the sun, with the moon, with the nature. So they are always uh, trying to 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 translate the the dreams to the others in the community and try to um, to act in the best way. Este, por medio de, por medio de, o sea, son sueños puntuales. Este, uno sueña, ves a este lugar, di estas palabras, ves a esta reunión, o nosotros, este, antes de dormir, pues, tengo esta situación, tengo aquello. Te voy a poner un ejemplo. Ahorita, lo del COVID-19. Uh -huh. eh, hubieron muchas abuelas que soñaron con, como con la receta, más o menos, como con las que plantas tenía que hervirse y qué teníamos que hacer. Y tú sabes que la cultura guayú, donde nosotros vivimos, cero hospitales, cero clínicas, o sea, nosotros no tenemos nada de eso. Y nosotros colocamos en práctica esos sueños, porque fueron sueños colectivos, incluso hasta cómo teníamos que vestirnos, qué, a qué hora teníamos que bañarnos, qué palabras teníamos que decir, y el ritual cuando la persona se está abogando y eso. Y fíjate que la comunidad guayú, en fallecimiento prácticamente, fue muy, 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 muy bajita y sin necesidad de, de tanta tecnología. Okay, uh, she's explaining about the dreams, how important are in the community. They uh, they always receive a, a specific message from the dreams, like the words that you have to use with others, the way you have to communicate, also the way you have to dress. And uh, she, the example she gave us uh, about the dreams is uh, in all these um, COVID situations, the, the global COVID situation, uh, they receive like a collective dream, uh, saying, uh, given the, the instructions how to handle this. So the instructions say that uh, with ki what kind of um, herbs they had to use and mix and infuse to prevent the, the virus and also the way they have to wear and also uh, the, the places they had to visit in those days. And uh, if, you, if you check the numbers of the Wayu people that uh, 
passed away into these virus situations are less than the other people of, uh, of Colombia. So there's actually quite a thin line between the spiritual world, craftsmanship, storytelling. Actually, there's no line. Like what we have here in the West, what also she was saying, we have a lot of boundaries. Everything is, yeah, yeah. you know, in different kind of boxes. While we're actually are talking here about something that's very more, um, it's yeah. floating, it's going everywhere. And it yeah. can be one thing, but it also can be the other thing. Like how does she see that? And also what does she want to tell this audience to take from this conversation because it's a totally different way of thinking working with art but also with spirituality than a lot of people have here um, bueno y, y Raquel un poco dice que entiende de lo que dijiste ahorita que la línea que separa la espiritualidad con la realidad es bastante delgada para ustedes que incluso ni siquiera existe que eso es un pensamiento como muy occidental de que todo está como dividido el cielo y la tierra, sino que ustedes fluctúan entre eso bastante. Entonces, eh, lo que ella quiere saber eh, es cómo viven eso, cómo, cómo, es, eh, eh, cómo es esa relación entre, eh, eh, o sea, cómo, cuál es la diferencia entre una persona que, traba, que trabaja en, 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 en Occidente versus a cómo ven el, el, la, la relación del cielo y la tierra ustedes. Bueno, para mí, Occidente, no sé, se preocupa mucho por, por, por las cosas como económicas, eh, casa, carro, todo eso. Y, o sea, nosotros los Guayú nos preocupa que la naturaleza esté bien cuidada, que, que, haya, que en el mar haya pescado, por lo menos en Punta Coco, que está Puerto Bolívar, eso nos preocupa. Para, eso, para nosotros es preocupante porque la vida marina ha cambiado. Es importante porque, como te vuelvo y te digo, nos, para nosotros el mar, la tierra, los animales son nuestros. Waleker traduce araña, es un animal, pero para mí es mi abuela, mi abuela, porque ella fue la que me enseñó a tejer. O sea, nosotros no estamos imitando de la naturaleza nada. Ella nos enseñó como un ser que, a, que también nosotros pertenecemos. O sea, somos como del mismo linaje. Uh -huh. yeah. Ajá, Occidente. Occidente ve la tierra, no sé, este, lo, la ve diferente. Es más importante para ellos. como eh, Y eso es respetable. O sea, yo no estoy criticando, no estoy... Uh -huh. Simplemente me está preguntando la, la diferencia. Uh, she is uh, reflecting about the difference between uh, Western thinking and also what you, and she said uh, that uh, in the Western way of living, they are always focused about um, the economical way of living and how to get uh, money and how to get in business. And, For the way you people, the, 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 they are focused on nature and how to keep uh, the nature, how to keep this relationship between nature and them. And also uh, for them, it's really important having the, the fish in the, in the waters around them or having the, the, the plants uh, in the best way ever. Uh, because they depend of them, and it's not just the they depend of the nature. It's because the the nature is like the grandmother. The nature is the the grandmother that t uh, it takes time to teach teach them how to live, uh, and also the 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 nature. She said the nature is is her grand is is like the granddaughter uh, mother because uh, Waleket that is the name of the might of women, is, um, is an spider. So if the women is an spider and call Waleket, she say Waleket is her grandma. O sea, nosotros, este, si tenemos una armonía con la tierra, con la naturaleza, y nosotros los Guayú, es, se traduce eh, en, en armonía para nosotros tanto emocionalmente como físicamente. Si hay esa armonía, nosotros también, o sea, vamos, vamos como en esa armonía. O sea, nosotros creemos mucho en las energías de la naturaleza, en las energías del universo, 
eh, en todas esas energías se traducen en armonía, en salud, este, y, y como que, o sea, como, como que la energía de adentro, la parte interna, se traduce, o sea, sale. No hay que buscar como nada afuera, uh -huh. que afuera no hay, no hay, bueno, lo que, pues, pero... Pero si tú tienes una energía bonita por dentro, tienes un buen corazón, este, armonía con todos los seres humanos, es difícil porque no es fácil. Pero si tú tienes eso, eso es lo que tú vas a mostrar. Y eso es lo que tú vas a atraer uh -huh. sin tanto complique. Okay. Uh, well, she, she is trying to explain us this relationship uh, with the nature and how important for them is keep the balance between the nature because if you are in balance uh, with, with all around them, uh, everything goes in the best, west, uh, the best way. And, uh, and also she say that if you, they believe about the, the energy of the universe, the, the energy of the, the people, the energy of the nature, and uh, all this energy, uh, if you can reflect this good energy on you and you have like a good heart and you are kind with the others and try to keep like a good, a good relationship with, with the rest of, of the human beings, Uh, it, it means that you are having this balance with the nature and and you are like uh, in peace with the with all all around you. Este concluyo diciendo que si tú te entre más te preocupes por tener algo, o sea, son energías que, que, que te hacen mal uh -huh. y, y, y quizás vas a tener más de eso, pero si tú estás este, buscando tu paz tu tranquilidad eh, eh, esa armonía pues que tratamos de buscar nosotros los guayú como seres humanos, eso es lo que vamos a eso es lo que vamos a obtener. Yeah, uh, if you are focused trying to get more resources and uh, get more money, uh, probably you will receive more than this. It's gonna be, it will be like a long cycle that you're gonna stay in in a loop, living this thing ever, uh, over and over again. And then it, it's totally different when you are connected with this energy and this harmony. And when you are more focused on this, uh, you will be like they were you people that is focused uh, to be in, in, in a harmony with them and with others. Un momentico. Ustedes están privilegiados, Amsterdam es lindo, es hermoso y como seres humanos han logrado muchas cosas eh, y pues yo lo felicito por eso, me ha gustado la ciudad y, y tienen muchas cosas que agradecer. Yo que vengo de Punta Coco, que no hay luz, no hay agua, no hay, mejor dicho, nosotros somos magos, nosotros viví, sobrevivimos y vivimos tranquilos, tratamos de vivir en armonía, entonces yo les deseo pues que pues eh, mucho, mucho amor de nuestra cultura y pues los felicito como, como personas y como ciudad. Yeah, she wants to uh, say uh, to you that you are so lucky because you live in an amazing city. The city is full of things and you got like, mm, like a huge thing in the whole history of, the, of this place. Uh, and she's comparing a little bit with her community and all these tough situations that they had, like no water, no electric resources, uh, uh, sometimes no food. So you have to be really uh, grateful with this and then remember all the beauty that you have around. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, We have to finish or wrap up. <laughs> But thank you so much again. And um, I think also we can do a round of four questions. So if anyone likes to speak up, maybe ask them something about uh, yeah, the OU community in Colombia itself. Anyone? <laughs> Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Um, es un honor. Muchas gracias para, para venir a, a Bali. Gracias, thank you. Uh, Raquel and her team and the Bali and uh, usted también. Um, le agradezco mucho para venir y explicar sobre sus ancestros, 
sobre su historia. Um, me siento muy contenta porque yo vengo de Aruba. Sí. Y, um, Y me siento muy conectada con la Guajira. En 2017 fui con uh, mi esposo y un grupo a hacer un, 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 un cultural exchange. Un, una, una, y fuimos con un amigo de nosotros que él es fundador, se llama Clifford Rosa que viene de una fundación que se llama Fundación Rancho, que está en Aruba. Y él nos invitó conjuntamente con un grupo, fuimos un par de días a, a La Guajira y para hacer un intercambio cultural, eso, eso es. Y ese um, intercambio fue increíble. Hablé, a, fuimos a una ranchería, ahora no me acuerdo muy bien, el nombre, pero uh, fu fuimos a una familia, fuimos a, donde, a, a, a conocer y a sentar con una familia, un clan, y fue algo verdaderamente impresionante, porque um, la mujer, la, la, la mujer Guayú, es tan fuerte, es tan um, importante. <risa> Es tan importante y me, me tocó mucho. Y en mi familia, en mis ancestros, yo creo que hay un, una línea ya, de, porque tengo familia de Venezuela y tengo familia de Colombia. Y estoy ahora buscando esa conexión. I think that I have to resume a little bit, but this has been really touching. She has been uh, explaining to Sindri that uh, she uh, has been really connected with uh, Aruba. Uh, maybe you guys uh, are not located, but La Guajira is in the north side of the Caribbean region in Colombia. So the distance between the island of the Caribbean and Colombia is really, really close. You can see also, it. Also, historically, yeah. we believe that we were that the great Caribbean that uh, units all the Caribbean region, not just the islands, also all the shore that is in the Caribbean Sea, but the deep Caribbean, that is the, the deep region of the of Colombian Caribbean that I'm from. And uh, the the thing that she was trying to explain her that the, she had like a, an an special connection with the communities in La Guajira. There's a part of the history that is never tell. Uh, I say it because uh, I'm an art teacher and I try to explain to my students that the big Caribbean is really connected uh, historically. So I totally understand you because La Guajira always the, has this. Uh, navigating uh, with with boats from the, the yeah from the the Aruba to La Guajira and they used to change Excellent. parts of the culture and it, it's really easy to arrive from there but they, the, uh, the 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 story about Colombia never tell about this how close we are with the with this great Caribbean movies like I think we were talking uh, the last time and we were talking about the, the story of the spider and it's funny enough because a lot of people actually they know the story from Ghana from the Kente weaving and actually I'm, I want to ask you if you can tell it it's almost the same and I got like goosebumps from it when that happened. It was so crazy because we all know it as Anansi, the spider. But Waleke well, is the same. It's like it's just a few things that changed but it's too close. So 
can I ask you maybe just to give a small summary because I think this is something we also have to and that's why these storytelling things are so important. We are closer, we are very close to each other but we just forget because people make boundaries, they make borders yeah. to make it impossible. Yeah, remember Pangea, you know, this all idea of this continent. Uh, bueno, ella básicamente lo que quiere decir Raquel es que cuando exploró toda esta cultura en África, eh, en Ghana específicamente, como que encontró muchas similitudes con la historia de Waleke. Oh, <laughs> can you repeat the, the question that I forgot? I was so can, can you hear the story of the spider of Waleke? Ah, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I know it if you want to translate it immediately because <laughs> yeah, she would take I know, time. I know, I know. So, uh, the Waleke that she was talking about, uh, it was... Uh, little girl that has in the middle of the desert she was alone and she was like the ugliest girl ever in the desert she was alone there and there was a hunter who was walk, uh, walking around there and found this little girl in uh, with the cactus around and i'm protecting and he said well i'm gonna take you to my home i'm gonna take care of you so uh, uh, she took Waleke, this little girl, to the house, the, uh, to his house, and he, uh, she started to living with the sisters of him. And the sisters say, "Well, you're so ugly. We don't love you, and we can't support having you here. So why are you going?" They, they try to make him like the impossible life ever to her. So, but this little girl that has like a big uh, magic inside, uh, a lot of magic inside, uh, every single night start to whip and from her mouth start to, um, a lot of jars so of like different colors came out. Yeah, yeah. came out from the, uh, her mouth. Uh, with these jars, she, start, uh, she started to weave and create like the most beautiful bags and, uh, and chinchorros. And every single day, these sisters that invited her, uh, they took all these bags and showed to the hunter and say, well, can you see it? We, we made it. Uh, and he started to doubt this because they were not talented on this but it was a kind of weird to find all this stuff there. Uh, one day, uh, he discovered that the, this little girl that now is a, a, is a damsel, a transforming a damsel, a beautiful damsel, um, made this, all this creation. She, he tried to marry her, but when he decided to, uh, to do it, uh, she became a spider. So she's the mother of the weavers in, in La Guajira. That's the story of Walek. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're close, huh? <laughs> like I see him. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know if the, who knows the, like the Anansi story, but it's actually there are two hunters going into the forest and they find this amazing big spider web. And from that web, actually, they took the clothes off that were in that web and they brought it to the king to show it to the king and that is actually how Kente weaving started. And only like the king was allowed to actually wear this kind of cloth. And this is exactly also when we go d deep diving deep in this story, they have so much resemblance. And it's crazy because at this moment, like these two worlds are blocked, there's nothing, it's almost impossible. So it's very important as well that we can have in these moments of like to share. Yeah, of mm -hmm. course. Lo que dice Raquel es eso, como de todos estos puntos de convergencia entre Hola. la historia de la historia, la historia de Waleke, pues que te hace pensar que en algo, de alguna manera estamos interconectados a pesar de que estemos geográficamente muy separados. Como Yo pienso que este, eh, la cultura africana también tiene mucho contacto con la naturaleza. Las culturas indígenas en general, no solamente la Guayú, porque conozco también amigos arubacos, uh -huh. este, amazónicos, todas las culturas originarias uh -huh. tenemos conexión porque es que antes, antes, por lo menos los pueblos indígenas, antes de la colonización, nosotros, nos, nosotros no conocíamos por lo menos las religiones. Uh -huh. la, para nosotros siempre fue... Este, nuestro origen ha sido la naturaleza y por, por eso es que de pronto tenemos esa, esa misma conexión y también lo, lo relaciono con, con el pueblo africano. 
She said that she finds many things in common with uh, African indigenous cultures. And also she said that uh, if you check the stories about uh, from the different uh, indigenous communities in Colombia, if you know, in Colombia we have more than 100 uh, indigenous communities in the Caribbean region of Colombia, we have 32 with different language. Uh, uh, it's like a patchwork in the same region. So uh, she finds, uh, she is trying to explain that before colonization, we, they never believe in, in the shirk and they never had these religions and they never had this way of living, the, this global way of living with boundaries of kind of things. Uh, because they used to believe just in nature and that's something in common with the uh, Caribbean indig um, African uh, indigenous communities and also Colombian too. Are there any other questions? <laughs> Eh, quiere, quiero darle las gracias por aceptar la invitación de Raquel y estar aquí en Ámsterdam. Y bueno, muy contenta estoy de mi madre, Soyu. Soy de EPU, la familia EPU. Y eh, bueno, me siento muy conectada con usted. Y eh, un poco me siento mal también porque unos uh, un mes atrás, algo así. Tuve un día muy lindo y me salió, me salió una, una, una araña muy grande. Y lo que hice es, es matar la, la, la araña. Así que me, con esta historia no voy a hacerlo jamás y nunca más. Qué bien, Qué bien por lo menos estoy aquí y hice algo que de no vas a matar la nosotros, ahora que tú dices Epiyú, nosotros la comunidad Guayú, nuestra organización social es por clanes. Eh, 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 nuestra creación, eh, primero fueron las deidades, vamos a resumirlo, ¿verdad? Segundo, eh, eh, las plantas. Tercero, eh, los animales. Y de último, nosotros los Guayú. Eh, con eso quiero decirte, con eso te quiero dar, decirte que nosotros venimos... Este, exactamente de un animal, o sea, nuestro clan es un, nuestro totem es un animal. <laughs> yeah. She's trying to explain the, how the community, uh, the Wajú community is organized. Um, they are organizing clans and uh, the, the first uh, are the goddess, the goddess and gods, and after that is, uh, they are the, the, is the nature, the nature, the animals, and every single clan can, uh, comes from, a, from, from one animal. That's the reason that we are really close, they are really close with the animals. Epiyayú es un ave que se llama Cari Cari. Y Puana, yo soy Puana. Este, ¿Me ven este símbolo que está aquí? Como una H. Yeah. Eh, ese es el símbolo de mi, de mi animal, que viene, o sea, de mi ancestro, que es un ave que se llama Cari Cari. Eh, no, yeah. de esta cosa. Nosotros los hipuanas tenemos características de esa ave. Los epiyú tienen características de ave, y así todas las, todos los clanes. Oh, my God. Uh, if you see the, the, um, the symbol that she has in the, in the face that looks like an age, uh, is like a beard and means that their clan is a, is a, is a, um, a beard and their fa uh, her family has a lot of characteristics and many things from this beer. So it's the same thing as her that she is saying that uh, she is from Epiayu, is the, the Wayu name of the another animal. And probably her family will have like uh, some things uh, related with this animal. En, en la cultura Wayu, este, el nuestro apellido nos los da nuestra mamá. Es ma totalmente matriarcal. Como ustedes pueden ver, la cultura guayú es prácticamente toda la, 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 la creación femenina, el tejido femenino, el chinchorro femenino. Eh, y, y prácticamente este, nuestra, eh, sí, nuestra, nuestra, nuestro apellido no es como occidente que lo da el papá. Uh -huh. Nosotros nos lo da nuestra mamá, el útero nos lo da. Ok, uh, she's saying that um, the, the last name is, gave, is given from the mother. 
And if you see everything around the Wajju culture is from the uh, from the women, you know, the, the way they are dressing, the bags that they're using, and also the last name is something uh, the, that is it means that you you are you were in the uterus of dead woman, and that's the way to keep this connection with the mother. I have a small question for Raquel. Did you find your roots in Guajira? Mm. <laughs> like, like ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, like let's just say we have a good time every time we go there. So it's it's, it's home, but she knows. <laughs> No, Raquel disfruta de, de la brisa, del mar, de estar. Yo le digo, pero busca la sombra. No, 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 el sol, el sol. Yeah, este. <laughs> yeah she's saying that Raquel ha, eh, always eh, enjoy everything there, all about the nature, and always eh, enjoy the sun. And Sindri is always trying to uh, to stop her, please uh, avoid the sun, this, because uh, La Guajira is an overexposed uh, landscape. Uh, we are under uh, more than 35 degrees every day, uh, so you can imagine uh, how warm is it. You're in the middle of the desert, that's it. That's what yeah. she's <laughs> just said. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> De, de Uribia para, para los cocos hay un transcur hay un tiempo aproximadamente de tres horas en un buen carro este o sea en lo más cómodo y, y estas mujeres llegaron fue derretidas porque la pasaron llorando llorando todo el camino y yo también bueno y ustedes me van a hacer llorar a mí llorando pero de ver que es un pueblo tan bonito tan rico y, y pues los niños como están viviendo y toda esa situación bueno yo creo que este esa experiencia la, la, la debería contar más Raquel pues que, yeah. que yo eh, she's trying to explain us um, how was our experience there eh, as I said before, it takes almost four hours to, from uh, Uribia, that is the closest time to Punta Coco, and, uh, in a car, in a really, really good car. And uh, she was uh, saying that uh, she was so touching because Raquel and me, we were like crying the whole road uh, uh, because if you go there, you can see all the magnificence of the landscape. They have like many resources and well, this is a personal view, but uh, I think the, the, the government also, uh, all the politics, they know how rich the Guajira is. So, and the, the, you can imagine how po uh, uh, the, the kind of poverty you will see there. Yeah. If you get into the desert, you will find like a lot of kids requesting for money. So that's the reason that the culture is try is vanishing in time, because they prefer stay in the road uh, in a danger and dangerous situation. Because sometimes the car are driving really fast, and they're not like ten. We we talk about kids who just yeah. barely can walk, yeah. and they standing with their baby sister probably on their arm and just jump in front of the car because you need to stop because they ha they're hungry. It's like a really bad situation. I think also the country, uh, like this countryside is so strong. It actually showcase how strong these women are because it's so raw, but it is powerful. There's something, yeah. there's an energy, but that's exactly also yeah. the way the strategy of, of survival there. But really like something what I always, that's why I'm coming back and forth now still, yeah. is that the government is neglecting this place and they know how rich the history, also yeah. the importance that everybody from the Caribbean came as fishermen from this area. Like this is a very important space in the Latin Americas, but they actually just ruin everything. So these stories won't be told anymore. So the culture, the history, everything will be gone soon. Mm. So that's why also it's an important thing to talk here about is because you need to keep it. 
Yeah, you resume everything about <laughs> that. Yeah, is is because uh, the the government doesn't care all the uh, uh, all the, how important is the the community, how important is the, are the indigenous communities in in our country, and we were talking this morning about this because there's no laws to uh, to to preserve the customs. Uh, an example of this is the the girls when they are tr uh, in a transit from girl to woman. They have like a special ritual. Uh, they are they have to be enclosed into a hut for different days, supported by by all the women of the community, trying to explain them uh, how important is being a woman and all the the, the tools that you need to help the community. Uh, and also you have to drink a special tea to support all these movements in your uterus. It's, it's really, really an important ritual to the women in, in the Kiwayu community. And the, uh, the schools and the, the, the Colombian system around schools, also we have like a ethno, an ethno education, but it, is stupid because this uh, this education is not focused on communities because if the girls uh, take time to leave this ritual, they can go back to the school again. They are re rejected. So you can see all this con contrast between the laws that uh, are not made for them because they don't really care. They don't want the people there because this region is really, really rich. You see, in front of her community, that is Punta Coco, they have like a big city full of light. They are take, uh, using their wind and also living in their landscape, uh, using all these lands, these ancestral lands, to solve all the energy issues from another region of Colombia, not them. So if you go there, they don't have energy. They just have like a, a, a small solar power uh, solar panel that they use to connect every single uh, gadget of the community. So you can imagine how it is. But it's also with the water problem. Like the, this is like a really big city, a city of light. And I think the Americans yeah, are something, right? Yeah, looks kind of New York so City in front of you. When there are a couple of small houses there. Most of the time you sleep outside. If the community is running out of water and they go to the Americans, the Americans don't open the doors. They have a swimming pool, supermarkets, everything inside. And they, they look at them. This is their view, this you community. You can walk there, but it's just that that's already a border. There's no way they can get in. If somebody gets sick, somebody's dying in the community, they have a hospital in there, but there's no way they get in. So we, we really need to look at these kind of things. What is really going on in front of our eyes? Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they, it is, it's completely, I don't know, makes me feel courageous <laughs> because uh, I'm from Colombia and I can, I, I, I've been trying to use my uh, knowledge to help the, the, the uh, or make m maybe to recreate this. The, rebuild this story uh, that has been telling to also all the, the, the Caribbean people like me. Um, but sometimes it's exhausting because uh, they have like this big system and it's, they are protected by the Colombian government. And how do you fight against this? They prefer people dying. Uh, well, I remember a year ago, Cindy called me and she said that we don't have water. People is dying, uh, so could you help me with something? I say, okay, I felt like so small, like an ant. I say, okay, okay, we can do something and, and try to make visible what is happening there. But uh, we try to get help from these people and no answer because they, they don't really care. They prefer that having all this empty land to keep doing these big ports because our, our, this this land is in front of the big uh, the Great Caribbean, so it's easier to move and also uh, use the wind for the energy on everything and then. But I think it's all about hope, no? You to to 
keep this hope feeling yeah. between us. And, and as long as we do this, it will happen. Yeah. I think as I look also at the time and somebody looks yeah. really angry at me. <laughs> um, we also, we have a setup because you brought some stuff with you so also to show, to sell, to do everything. Also, we like to know a little bit about how we actually can support. And I think we can go and see the foundation. Uh, you have Instagram. I, I think when we now go outside, there's some time to talk and ask for more questions. I think okay. we have to round this up. I'm so sorry because I can <laughs> do this the whole night. Uh, but thank you guys so much again. And also, guys, thank you so much for listening. again good to see you guys again some new faces um, at the moment actually we were uh, watching one of the videos uh, Samaita sent in and it's part of like the I think it's part of the Bira festival right the guys so Samaita and I we know each other for some years 2015 14 something like when I first traveled to Zimbabwe to work with at my uh, to do a project on folk tales and taboos I didn't know what I got myself into, <laughs> but it was good. So we met, because you were still, you were like, yeah, the shaman at Simbanete with Chico. And we started to talk, and all of a sudden we understood that like the spiritual world and the art world in general more or less the same, the way of storytelling and the connecting with energies. 
And you always stayed somewhere in the back of my mind. We've been talking, and I told you one day you have to come to the Netherlands and be chill. So today is that day. <laughs> but no, uh, to be a little bit more serious, like you have some power I found in you when I was there that you are a f one of the few that actually realize what art can do and how important it is and how to tell that story, and especially because you're working with artists, you have a different way of looking at the world, and that's connecting with also your medical studies and like all the knowledge you have, that makes you a beautiful person to talk to, somebody who's really smart. You told me also once that if people want to have readings, they come to, can come to you, talk to you. So, but I think I should just invite you to the stage, and um, so you can talk a little bit for yourself. <laughs> So please, Samaita. <laughs> okay. It's easy. Thank you very much. Um, the person you are looking at is a shaman. Shaman, um, the most demonized um, profession. <laughs> the most demonized profession to others, if they looked, uh, if they think of a shaman, they think a shaman is a person who, who casts spells, who, who has magic and different sorts of uh, devilish uh, activities, but it's different. It's the other way around. A shaman um, who learned shamanism through the original indigenous knowledge system ways. I learned the hard way. I learned the hard way, the hard way that I don't want to re or to rethink about it in my life. I'm sorry, I'm not an English, a good English person. I can't express it very well, but I'll try. I'll try. So I'm sorry. In Zimbabwe, uh, we are very spiritual people. Though some of the things happened through colonialism, we changed, uh, changed us, uh, the approach and uh, the practices, but we can't run away from the original identity. So in some years back, in 1992, uh, when I was um, around um, 16 years, uh, something that I did not know, something that I, I did not figure out happened to me. I became ill, a very serious illness, a very serious illness that um, I almost lost my mind. Uh, uh, the, the illness that you can call psycho, what? psychosis. The illness that was very serious, that I, can, I couldn't even manage to control it. Uh, in my family, no one ever suffered that problem. So, uh, my father was still alive at that time. Um, you know, he used to go to work as a truck driver, come back home to see us as a family, then uh, see one of his sons. I'm a twin brother, by the way. I'm a twin, twin brother. My twin brother is at home right now. So, <laughs> one of his sons not feeling well, 
he tried to take a leave from work then to come and attend me. So he had to take me to the hospitals, to the doctors, to everybody who tried to help me. But nothing um, uh, materialized. So later on, he decided. He was given um, a, an advice by my big brother that, why can't you take this small boy to a healer? or a spiritualist, so that um, sometimes something good may materialize. That's what happened. That's what happened. That's uh, where everything was, uh, you call it what? Diagonal, what? Everything came together in the Came together, yes. right. Yeah. Then he was told that there is a spirit your forefather spirit on this boy. And he was very surprised. He did not like it. He did not like it uh, because uh, I don't know whether it was his experiences or something. I don't know. But he did not like it. So um, it's something else to become a spiritual person. The person that you are looking at practices spiritualism, healing, um, herbs, and everything nearly every day. That's my, my, my job, that's my duty. That's what I do. Uh, in those years, uh, I was taken for an initiation. After the spiritual, the spiritual uh, healer told my father that this guy has a spirit, I was automatically, it means I was supposed to go for an initi initiation. An initiation that no one in, in our lifetime would l choose just to lift your, your hand up and say, I would like to be one of those, or, or one of that, to be part of that activity. I was chosen without any choice. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. But our traditions, some of our traditions, uh, if, you are chosen, if you are chosen to do something, you have to accept it, whether I like it or not. It's not that they are cruel, it's not that they are demonic, it's not that they are, um, what, what is that other word that defines uh, the, the worst side of life? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I, d d d there's a reason for you being chosen, Ex and you have to do what you have to do. It's it's that sure. Mm. Yeah. So, I passed through that. I was chosen to stay in the bush, in the bush, in between of two mountains, and there was a river flowing this side, uh, a mountain on the other side, and a. And those type of mountains have big borders, a rock on top of another rock, big strong rocks. So I was left in the bush for eight months. And the day I was told to stay in the bush, I was not prepared. I was, uh, we had to go for a ceremony. Then after the ceremony, that idea of me, uh, stay in the bush was passed. I had no, no blanket, I had no, nothing to eat, I had no warm, a room to stay. Uh, only me, my clothes, no, nothing else. You know, tradition sometimes, they challenge you. They don't want uh, people um, who fear nature, people who, who are weak, 
They don't want that. They want strong people. Strong people to uh, the extent of uh, standing ground to be what you are. Because if you are weak, you won't stand the ground. Let's say there is a day uh, that you face somebody's a serious illness on some uh, experiences a serious illness on somebody. Then death just come across to that person. How will you stand that situation? Trying to help, trying to what? So, ancestors want us to be strong. They don't want weak people. We won't manage this world if we are weak. We won't manage our destiny if we are weak. So the life that I survived in the bush without any clothes, something to eat, the experiences were very serious. You know what? In the, in the first seven days, first seven days, I thought, uh, very soon they will come back and take me home. <laughs> first seven days. Then those seven days were not good. You know, uh, eight hours of the day waiting for somebody to come back and take you home. Then it passed. Then you sleep. You only rest when you are asleep. When you wake up, you start to think again what to eat what to entertain you, what to give you a, another warp. So I had to find activities because of hungry. Hunger gave me, a, changed me a lot. Then I start hunting. It, it's in the bush where you can hunt anything. Then I had to sharpen. You become whoever, uh, um, what, what is that film? Uh, uh, what is that? You, you get, in a way, you're going to think differently. So you <laughs> become creative, <laughs> right? You, you, you become creative. So I had to sharpen a very long streak for myself and go in the nearby river to find fish. Sure, I had to find three big brims, very big. Then after that, I had to make fire. So creating fire, there was no box of matches or a, what, a lighter to create fire. So I had to find ways. Sure, with my own ways, I had to create fire. Since that day that I created that fire, I did not leave this fire going down. I keep on applying food, the firewood, applying firewood nearly, nearly every day, big firewood so that it won't what? It won't go down. Sure. Uh, right, you have meat, that is uh, fish, then you fry them, you bab, you, you say barbecue, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, much better with, with that word. No sauce. Barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> right. Then there was no salt. Nothing to apply on this fish. You know, it was a very bad experience that I find out that uh, uh, firewood, uh, what do you call it? Ashes, if you apply it and set it on your food, it can test. Yeah, there is certain firewood that if you burn it, then you take the, 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 the ashes and apply it, it can test. And you can drink some water. <laughs> it gives a little bit extra taste if you put it on your food. <laughs> just uh, just yeah. some, not all the wood. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there is certain wood. Yeah. So I had to find out 
what to apply on the meat. So becoming a hunter like Tarzan in the bush. <laughs> yeah, Tarzan in the bush. Then Tarzan has to find ways. And you end up talking to the to the to, to, to anything in the uh, around, anything around you. You can talk to a bird, you can talk to a tree, you can talk to a butterfly. And you will learn, you come to learn that nature is there to communicate with us. It's not that we communicate with nature, but nature always wants to communicate with us. So, to those whom you see trying to preserve environment, it's because of that. Please, don't ever neglect environment. A tree is there for you. A butterfly is there for you. A bee is there for you. A bird is there for you. You can communicate with those things because they breathe the same way with you. So, uh, I experienced this in my lifetime because uh, I was forced to be in that situation. <laughs> I was forced to be in that, in that situation whether I like it or not. So, uh, one day, in the bush, I thought uh, I need a, a room somewhere to, to go in and rest myself. So I had to find st rocks, like small stones, and to build walls around um, a, a very big uh, uh, wall. Uh, that was like a cave, so I have to create my own room just to secure myself. So I did that in days. It took time for me to do that. Then uh, from there, I find some grass and try to make it smooth so that I can create somewhere to, 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 to sleep. Then later on, I've noticed that, ah, no, I need a door. But there is another way we, uh, I will create a door so fast. Then fire. The same fire that I, I created is the same fire that I, that was, that stand as my door for nearly eight months, for eight months. Because with fire, no wild animal, no snakes, no what will come and attack you. Fire was my defense. So I had to jump over the fire out, I had to jump over the fire coming in. So I had to maintain this fire to get rid of mosquitoes, to get rid of wild animals, snakes and stuff. So I was safe. Yeah. But to become a shaman, you have to learn. learn. You have to learn to, to be somebody who who can, who knows how to survive without anything. How to love one another. A pure heart, a very, um, um, extra, uh, Caring person. That's how to become a shaman. You can become a shaman who's rude, uh, hard hearted, and uh, uh, who, who has a bad spirit or a, a, a hatred who hate other people. No, you can't. You can't save lives in that situation. So to become a shaman, you need to be a very caring person. You need to be a very, a, 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 you call it long-hearted, long what? 
somebody. He, yeah. Like I think also you need to tolerance. be tolerant. Something that I do with tolerance. Yeah, but also the openness. Like you're open to everything. You don't <laughs> you don't judge. That's exactly. the thing. Exactly. So that's how I become a shaman. I was taught in all those eight months, tolerance, caring, uh, how to love one another. Because I survived for eight months without anybody. No one ever visited me in those eight months. So the day when they came, the, the day they came to, to take me out of this initiation was like something else. I did not believe them. Yes, I had no clothes because I had to create something to cover up my body. Out of uh, tree bugs uh, and whatever strings that I had to stitch something to cover up my body. It was something else. But uh, when they come, when they came, come to introduce me back home, uh, sure, it was another situation uh, that they saw me with so many activities, like yes, I was a potter, I had to collect clay, doing pottery by myself, uh, I mean, um, creating a kiln in the bush, trying to fire the, the plates and the clay pots for myself. I had my own industry, my own creativity, my own whatever. So that only that, that those activities alone gives me it relates me to what to how artists survive in the art studios that's how they survive they only need time by themselves you don't need to visit them when they are creating art if you keep on visiting the artist studio when the artist is busy creating something please you want they want they won't like you you are not invited. You are not invited. Is that, is that am I lying? Mm, no. <laughs> the, door, the door stays closed. <laughs> yeah, locked. Yeah. Yeah, well, the door will be locked. Mm -hmm. So at that time, the door was locked by the ancestors. For nobody should visit me to, and to tell me what to do in that situation. So, being left alone was a, it was a, such a grilling situation that it gives me strength. It gives me another mind, another set up, being set to be a very a reliable and a straight, straightforward person. Not even a person who can trick others, who can lie, who can become what he is not. Yeah. Because there are so many challenges in, the, in, the, in this practice. A lot of challenges. So, uh, the day they uh, visited me to, to take me home, I just hear a serious we we see uh, some people, some women were we, hulilating. Is that so? Hulilating, yeah, yeah. Is that so? Hulilating uh, and some bira, you know the bira that you were listening uh, before I came to to this uh, whatever. So they they tried to make it very loud. So I was surprised. Who are those people? But they were coming closer and closer and closer. So at uh, times you feel ashamed, shy, that what are, where, where am I to be, to, to, to meet all those people? I'm not ready. I tried to hide. 
because at times uh, you fed up of uh, thinking of other people. I was fed up. But when they come, my brothers were ready. They were ready for me. As I hide and tell them to go back because I'm fed, I, I'm fed I've, I cried for a long time. I cried for them looking ways to communicate with them. Uh, but it's only that I had no, what, cell phone or something, Thing. mobile, cell phone, whatever, to talk to them. So I tried even to, to talk to, to them visually. I mean, no, I don't know. I don't know. But I tried. But they did not hear me, and nobody ever visited me. So uh, my mother was the person who tried to talk to me, and she managed my mind and my heart. Yeah, she is my hero. <laughs> then I had to allow them they had to come to my place, and I had uh, a lot of things to show them a lot of experiences to, to share. Yeah, like dried meat, there were a lot of dried meat because as a hunter, how would you survive? Hunting was part of my activity. Uh, pottery, creating something was part of my activity. So I had a lot of things because to, to nurture my mind, to make my mind work nearly every day alone, I had to do something. So if you want to, to have yourself um, in good shape, mm, to avoid crying and being weak or behave like a small child, you need to introduce something new, something that is... Um, Keeps your mind occupied. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> so, uh, they, I had a collection. Meat, clay pots, clay plates, everything, herbs. Yeah, because I've learned a lot of uh, healing in the bush. Collecting uh, fruits, uh, edible fruits non-edible fruits, uh, chubas, um, leaves, whatever. I've done a lot of things like making ink or uh, paint or something, something to use, uh, mix with clay so that I can uh, change the color of something. Yeah, I tried all those things. Tint, uh, collecting sisal in the bush or uh, uh, Sisal from uh, tree bugs make long strings. Try to, I did make handbags in the bush. Stitch handbags, you know, with natural colors. So, uh, that's, those were some of my activities that I introduced, that uh, I had to cope up with, that I had to entertain myself with, that I have to, I have to uh, keep on uh, uh, engaging. So the story that I'm telling you is, 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 is a true story, a story that even right now um, I imagine a film of a, a true story from the real person the real actor. I passed that, that story. And right now, uh, I advise that the life that we think is ours is not ours. We don't own anything in this world. We own our flesh, this mortal body. But the 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 spirit, the, the spirit that we breathe is in and out is not ours. 
let's engage our true identity. That's where we came from. And that's where we are going. That's where we are heading. The spirit that we breathe is in and out is not ours. It belongs to somebody. It belongs to the creator. We only breathe this out and in and out because the creator still needs us to be alive. But we belong to somewhere else. We have so many experiences, different experiences. But what I've noticed is there is material life that we think material is, 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 is good. But what I've noticed is uh, the power that we have, the power that we have, we don't own it. And we need it to, we should understand that Being together like this is the most powerful way to survive. I survived alone for eight months. Alone, not talking to anybody. That experience alone is the, tells me that you need other people in order for you to survive. I came from Africa. Um, I was traveling. I've never traveled, tra traveled out of Africa. This is my first time. I would like to thank the Bali. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wholeheartedly, I want to thank the Bali and um, everybody here. We are related. You don't know how important you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be in front of you, to tell you my real story, how I survived, how I became a healer. And also, uh, I, want, I want to tell you that um, the, the good part of becoming a traditional healer is you are a servant of Everybody. I know how to, to treat ailments, ailments that hospitals can't. Hospitals can't treat diabetes. They can't. They only suppress, maintain it for the whole life. Hospitals can't treat um, asthma. They give you an inhaler to use for the whole of your life. Hospitals can treat um, high blood pressure. You'll be given pills to drink nearly every time for the whole of your life. The time I was given this practice, in Africa, uh, there was HIV. And AIDS. People died in Africa. People died in Africa. And that challenged me because people had no choice. They would bring a almost dead person to my shrine, to my space, for me to treat. Because at that time, antiretroviral drugs were not common in Africa. It was rare to, for people to find antiretroviral uh, drugs. But I had to do a research. I've done a lot of research in traditional herbs, natural herbs. I had to create an 
antiretroviral drug from the bush with a mix of 88 herbs. Yeah, because you want to recondition an immune system that is already gone. So I've tried, I've done what was needed at that time. You know, at some point, uh, there is uh, this saying that how to survive where there is no, there is no doctor. We are not treated as doctors. We are not being called as doctors. We are traditional healers. So where there is no doctor, where there is no hospital in Africa, uh, uh, treatments are not that uh, available. We buy uh, pills and very powerful uh, injections from our, our source right now is India. Yeah, India has that. Yeah. So at that time, uh, antiretroviral drugs were coming from India. Yeah, it's different from now because uh, these days they managed to source those uh, drugs for the people, for, f for people to access them. Yeah, but a, a lot of people died. I want to tell you, uh, even Corona never killed quite a big number in Africa than HIV. So when Corona came to Africa, we said, ah, <laughs> we are not surprised because we had a very serious situation more than this. We have passed a very serious situation more than this. So when Corona comes, I had to do my research for only to find out that three herbs can deal with Corona, though bitter, but it's good because they save life. <laughs> yeah. But they're so bitter to taste, my God. I had a thing, they gave me what in Ghana. It helped. It Five helped. days later, I was fine, but <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, bitter. Yeah, yeah. That pineapple peel, that's like, they have, to, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, for giving me this opportunity. Though my English and is not that expressive, uh, please don't mind. I'm not an English person. Mm -hmm. I don't come from UK. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Though I wish I would be one of those good English-speaking people. But, yeah, that's what I am. But I've tried my best. Please forgive me to those who do not understand what I was saying. But um, I would like to thank Dibala again and the team, Raquel, and everybody. Shayin, <laughs> uh, I still owe you. <laughs> 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 I still owe you. You presented very well. Thank you. Uh, you too. <laughs> I'm coming to Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to Colombia. So, uh, coming to Amsterdam, coming to Holland, is it Holland? The Netherlands, Holland. You still can choose whatever you prefer. Okay. Well, Netherlands or Holland. Holland. I was surprised that this country has two names. <laughs> <laughs> no other country in this world is though. <laughs> it took some time. Yeah. I asked, I asked, asked her, where is Holland? Holland, Holland. She said, no, you are in Holland, you are in the Netherlands. <laughs> How come two countries, two Two capital cities. Okay, so you people, you tricked us. <laughs> you tricked the world. <laughs> but I like uh, your country. I like the people, the nature of the people that I saw here. Please, 
to those who are culturally uh, uh, let's say initiated all right because becoming become being, being an artist you are culturally initiated you pass through such certain stages to become what you are besides education to be an artist let's take away education it's not about education to become an artist no that's a spiritual initiation it's a gift that is in you am, am, am i am i right please oh. continue <laughs> <laughs> it is a gift no, but it's very it much. is a gift that is in you in order for you to be a creative person something somebody who can uh, think something new i always admire europe i always admire europe i'm very sorry to say that i'm not i'm not against africa i'm not word on i'm not against africa if you come to africa in zimbabwe right now the embers of netherlands they have a cultural center if you go to the to american embers they have usaid french they have uh, alliance franchise uh, germany they have zimbabwe german society but if you go to europe and want to find out what are africans <laughs> embassies doing they are empty i like that i like that we don't need to to blame others uh, because of what we failed to to become but sometimes the truth yields the truth uh, 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 the truth can give us a, sh a, a very fair sh shared platform. We don't need to blame others. So culture is the only thing that can bring people together, that can bring communities together. I come from a very big community. Uh, where I am a, a father, a grandfather, a, a very a well, a, a well needed person who has a lot of responsibilities. Uh, so uh, it's part of healing. So uh, let's go back to what I was trying to express when it comes to art. Art, uh, in order for an artist to, create, to, to be creative, you need to be informed. You need to be inspired. You need to be... Uh, uh, you need a spirit. Yeah. You have guardian spirits. To those who do art, understand it. You have guardian spirits on you that give you the inspiration. That gives you the, the, that visual mind to create art. It's not that you have learned art. I know it's new to this world. But truly speaking, you are many gods. You are many gods. Being an artist, uh, to create something new for people to appreciate tomorrow, uh, it means you are from, you are not just an ordinary person. You are just. You are not just a person. It means there is something on you that inspires you in order for you to do what you are doing. So, those 
that's the advantage we have in this world, that the Creator gave us those spirits, those guardian spirits, in, to work with us, to give us that, those energies of keeping on thinking something new nearly every day, uh, try to figure out how can I bring out something that people, after the, the studio visit or an exhibition, people will appreciate you. It's not something that you get from the book or from your lecturer, from your college or whatever, from wherever you, you have learned at. Yeah, there are a lot of um, well-educated people, but <laughs> to become a, a powerful artist doesn't need education. But can you tell I've, me, like, I have one question. Yeah. The communication of the official and the communication of the spiritual, they have, like, they are aligned. Yes. Sort of. Yeah, exactly. Can we go into that? Like, how, where do they connect? What is that exactly, the, the way of communicating? Because it's also a language that even doesn't acquire, like, spoken word. It can be via colors, like also dance, music. There's so many things we can tap in that can be in visual art, but it also can be connecting do, during whatever rites or anything. And they have a sort of similarity. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So you want the relationship? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the meeting point? The meeting point. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there is always a meeting point. Yeah, when I came in here in Amsterdam, uh, <laughs> yesterday after I arrived, at, at the airport, I was given a, 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 I had a picture <laughs> that I was supposed to go at a meeting point. At the airport, there is a, yeah, it's written, meeting point. <laughs> Where people come with banners and papers written, names. But, yeah, he left me at the airport. <laughs> because I'm not used with this traveling. It's my first time to be out of Africa. We lost him for four hours or five. Four hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, truly speaking. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'll give you uh, uh, my sto that story after I answered the question. So the meeting point. <laughs> um, why is that... Artists don't want visitors in the studio when they are creating art. Why? You are in a process. <laughs> you don't want people who come and talk about your art that you are doing because you are in a process. It's not about being busy. It's not about being busy. It's about the spirit that is in you. That doesn't want uh, any other spirit, any other intervention. Yeah. It doesn't want to be disturbed. Yeah. It doesn't want any, any intervention. You need to do it by yourself. Because if this work is not finished, it means the spirit is not satisfied. You need to finish the work. Because there is an exhibition day. There is, an, there is a day, uh, an open studio day, where people will come and comment and do the critique about your artwork. So whether you are at a certain level uh, of your cre creativity, but you need people, you need to, to, to have something to explain to the people. Be because people will ask, and you should have answers. <laughs> so that's why I said there is a spirit that influences you to close the doors for everybody. It doesn't mean that you are a very selfish person. No. But you want to finish 
what has been influenced in you by your guardian spirit. So we don't survive by ourselves. You know, this world, this European world, European world has um, welcomed creativity very much. That's why Europe has developed. You can't introduce something new if you don't welcome new, something new. You need to welcome something new so that you can introduce something new. That's why Europe is still developing. Um, what we are talking about is about uh, how spirits work in us. We need to see the future before we are there. That's how the spirits influence us. We don't want to be behind, to stay behind, to remain behind of what is happening. We should see things before we reach uh, where it is happening. You know, what's, what's important is the spirits that works in us are there to give us the influence. Then from influencing us, they inspire us to do something. Then that inspiration alone is very important. We have to keep it. It's a treasure. So that we can keep on being influenced, being informed, being uh, inspired to do what we do. So it's not about us. That's why I did say it's not about us. It's not about this mortal body. In order for me to heal somebody, no, this mortal body can be there, but it can't uh, gather the information or some resources to heal an, uh, an ailment. No. But if you take me in the bush, there is a spirit that inspires me to collect this root and that chuba and that, those leaves, mix them together in order to deal with this ailment. It's not about me. It's not about this. Because without a spirit, we are empty. We are just empty people. So let me try to express something that will be, it might be new, but it's the truth. A logic, logic, the thing that we call logic, Logic is from, what, is from what we learn from school. In spirit, we don't have logic. We don't have logic in spirit. There is nothing like logic in spirit. So, uh, in spirit, uh, we always uh, acquire uh, new things. We always uh, have new information. We are always informed uh, uh, new techniques. That's why every creative person here never, never uh, stopped to create. So, you remain a mini God in your lifetime. So, become one. Be one. Keep on creating. But never forget that you are not alone. Never. That's why I have uh, heard from uh, some uh, art collectors that never try to negotiate or else uh, 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 never try to evaluate somebody's creativity because it's from somebody. 
uh, to you who, who talk about art nearly every day, uh, uh, curators. <laughs> Is that true? You don't want art to be negotiated? Huh? <laughs> never, never. <laughs> Just quiet. <laughs> You negotiate art. Tell you, off. You negotiate art. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> art, per se, can be negotiated only through money. Only through money. That's when it becomes a form of. What we call negotiations only through money. Uh -huh. And that becomes the power of money. Uh -huh. Some art never sees daylight because it goes from the studio to a safe. And it is committed to that safe before it is even made. That's when it becomes problematic. Uh -huh. So to negotiate art is to also give it a passage in time, in place, for a greater public. And that's also curation. To make sure that art doesn't just go into a collection and into a safe without seeing daylight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, as you heard, where I came from, there is Zimbanete Arts and Culture Tra uh, Interactions Trust, an arts and culture organization that we uh, founded in 2005, uh, then formally registered in 2008. Um, um, we um, came to create this organization with my co-founder, uh, Chiko Chazunguza, who is um, arts, who was an arts lecturer uh, in so many institutions in Zimbabwe. Uh, he has been to Holland. <laughs> he has been to Holland. He painted a bridge somewhere in Holland, a bridge that opens and clo opens for for ships to pass and closes for cars to. <laughs> Somewhere, I don't know where that bridge is, but it is in Holland. He was here to do that. He was commissioned to do that. Yeah, um, there is a mural, mural that he did in Holland. So yeah, um, Zimba Net and Art and Culture Interactions. Um, we have come up with so many uh, powerful artists. Uh, that are doing well in the in this world, even uh, powerful artists in Zimbabwe, very powerful artists in Zimbabwe come from Zimbabwe arts and culture interactions, because we don't just mentor or else uh, do a workshop. We also give a spirit. We don't want empty people to explore the world. You can just explore a world, the world whilst you are a, an empty person. You need a spirit on you so that the spirit g keeps on giving you power, giving you uh, the insight to do things. So we have worked with so many artists in, that, in those areas. Chico on the art side, me on the spiritual side or on the culture side. So that's how we are driving Zimbanete, though um, in Africa, culture doesn't pay. Yeah, that's why our organization is still struggling. I'm happy at least today, um, after a long time uh, of practi practice, I was invited, and this naughty girl tried by us. <laughs> she tried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she tried to, yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that I don't want to meet other people. No, I, I want to meet new people, to talk to people, 
and also engage other, the other new world. But also uh, not leaving my practice. Because that's where, that's what gives me what I am today. To be what I will be in the future. So, uh, at Zimbanete, uh, where I came from, um, artists, workshops, residences, uh, we do artist workshops, residences, and mentorship programs, and also cultural programs, I mean residences. We offer cultural residences to those who want to learn about spirituality and art, as we are discussing today, and those who want to learn uh, 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 spirituality, uh, healing, and uh, wants to be initiated to become somebody like me. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to me. It, it was quite a moment to be with you. Uh, very influential people, very good people. Thank you very much once again. Thanks. Thank you. you still want to do music dancing? Uh -huh. You want to do some music and some dancing? Yes. Ah? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was just waiting for it, but it took so long. <laughs> That's why I'm standing here. Is that possible? Can we have the last video or the first video? Yeah. Last one or first one? Um, there is another thing that I want to justify. I want to justify something in front of everybody. In Africa, when we are doing this traditional practice, in Zimbabwe, especially in my traditions, we have traditional snuff. Yes, I've tested European snuff from Germany, snuff from um, uh, Germany, Austria, and other. Yeah I've, yeah, I've tested those snuffs, but I've never tested your snuff here. If you have one, please try. To um, give um, me a test. Direction, guys. <laughs> yeah. Any cigarette uh, yeah. store we can find this? No, this snuff know. is not Knife the buck. like coke. No, this is traditional snuff. It's not cocaine. No. No. It's traditional. <laughs> very, very, very good. <laughs> I'm feeling very, very good. I start to think normal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. Do you want some? Mm -hmm. okay. Just a little bit because it's 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 kind of spicy in a way. Please. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. You yeah, the way you you give me your hand. We, yeah. <laughs> it's a very good one. Very powerful, good one. Yeah. yeah. This is our traditional stuff. Thank you. Sure. In Brazil, okay? All right. <laughs> so, whoever has a connection with, uh, with uh, snuff from uh, Netherlands, please don't hesitate to, to bring it to me. Yeah, sure. we're waiting tomorrow for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I only have you tomorrow morning, then in the afternoon I'll be gone. We will fix something. Tomorrow, this time, I'll be in the, in the yeah, yeah, the, the worst experience in my lifetime. But now you know what a meeting point is, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any questions? So are we ready with the video? Oh, it's the video. Yeah. The first one, last one, which one? Uh, this, the last one, the, the first one or the last one? The east of the last. Uh, I don't know. This one?
Do you like this one too? Okay, uh, you have another one? <laughs> but can you tell me a little bit uh, who is playing here? Okay, and what you want, yeah, okay. You can go ahead with this one. No. 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 That's not ours. <laughs> That's totally something different. <laughs> We can still dance though, but... Otherwise, just the first one? Anders gewoon de eerste. Ja. Oké, dan we just do this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is my space where I doing I do my traditional healing ceremonies. Uh, musical, this is our traditional music, Bira. Bira is Zimbabwe traditional and spiritual music. So when we are doing the healing, we play this music. Um, we can even teach, we can even uh, share, it's okay. We have uh, once a lot of Bira, there is a lot of Bira players in Zimbabwe. Uh, this guy with scotched shirt is from the southeast of Zimbabwe. The other one on the other side with a black uh, hat, uh, with golden whatever in, on top, is my nephew. Yeah. Uh, there is the other one on the other side. There are three of them. Is my brother. So this house is a big house that can uh, even uh, have a capacity of more than 500 people inside yeah we do a uh, whole night ceremonies to appease the spirits to appease the ancestors and the guardian spirits yeah we brew our traditional beer that lasts for seven days Uh, brewing, then that brew happens to be our excitement on the day. Yeah. This is my brother. If you want to look, yeah, we have some similarities. Yeah. Yeah. He's a very, very good beer player. Uh, and another thing, um, in Zimbabwe, we have totems. Totems, myself, I have my totem. Uh, as you heard that, I am Samaita. Samaita is related to zebra. So I am zebra. Some are lions, some are elephants, some are uh, baboons, some are... So we are related to nature. So, a totem name is a very important name. You don't leave it. We survive with it. Uh, the relationship that we have with our totems is um, uh, we relate it to our DNA, to our blood. So, my clan are all zebras. So, to, th to those who are... Um, Dubes, like me, are all zebras. They are related to a zebra animal. Even if you go to South Africa, even if you go to Zambia, Malawi, in Southern Africa region, we have totems. Yeah. Yeah. So, a uh, totem name is very important. It relates me to my, uh, that's our clan name. Yeah. So, uh, We have so many totems. Some of the totems are uh, um, uh, animals from the, from the bush. Some are domestic animals. Some are currents like uh, the Zulu people. Uh, they have the totem of uh, the river. They are related to the river. Uh, Zulu people from South Africa. 
they are related from the river. So we have totems in our culture, in our traditions, the totems that we respect very much. If you have any question about totems, please ask. Anyone? <laughs> you also told me once, uh -huh. uh, and you still need to finish that never ending story, like storytelling as well, because we did this project which about folk tales and taboos. Yes. The, the storytelling, especially the history of Greater Zimbabwe, it's, it's quite big, but it's also something that's very specialized around like the campfires, the talking. Because what I really liked before was that we always sat down for eight hours straight up talking and only telling stories. So that also that moment of storytelling is very, very much important, connected also with the Bira. Uh -huh. Okay. That's something that's very particular. Okay, okay. Um, uh, okay, it is also a true, true story mm -hmm. uh, uh, that happened around 1600. Um, uh, when we discussed about that, uh, that story, uh, we, were, we discussed about uh, taboos and... Uh, Folk tales. Folk tales. Uh, taboos are like do's and don'ts. We, in Africa, we survive with those uh, parameters, do's and don'ts. Don't sit by the doorstep, because the doorstep has some in and out forces that will engage you and disturb your spirit yeah because what we what we uh, secure most is the spirit that uh, that is on you that uh, defines what you are um, don't eat the uh, don't eat food that has uh, okay in our traditions men don't eat food that is last for a night because that food has certain scientific changes that um, can uh, uh, make you sick. Make, not making you, making you sick, but change your hormones or your, your energy. Yeah. Um, I forgot the scientific word. Yeah. The? <laughs> the? The estrogen grow, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it, make, it makes men weak. So you don't eat the food that lasts a night. Yeah, yeah. So those do and, do, do and don'ts are very important in our culture. We don't just survive. We don't just... Uh, we, we, we are very careful in that. So that's why Raquel uh, came up with that uh, point of having tab uh, taboos being discussed. So when we discussed about taboos, um, there is a story that um, we discussed about. It's about um, a certain clan, the Roji people of the Monumtapa Empire, who, dis uh, who survived from Mozambique, who survived in Southern Africa from Mozambique, Zambia and Malawi, Zimbabwe, Zambia and Malawi, uh, but they were based in Mozambique in the Maputo area. So when Munumtapa died, the first Munumtapa died, the second Munumtapa uh, around 1600, they shifted from Maputo to Zimbabwe. Anybody who has been in Zimbabwe, there is an area that we call Matebeleland, where the Ndebele people of the Zulu uh, people uh, uh, are right now. 
it was Munumtapa space. So one day, uh, in order for the Munumtapa, the second Munumtapa people to please their king, they said they want to take down the moon to present it to their king to please the king. Truly speaking, they tried to make a ladder. <laughs> they cut trees. They collected big, huge borders, rocks, in order for them to create a very tall ladder to reach the moon. Sure, it happened. Uh, a lot of people were gathered together, experts, uh, engineers of their time, <laughs> and whatever um, resources were, were there. So it was a very big job. Um, they started creating the base or the, 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 the foundation of having this ladder going up. So when they did that, uh, that king, today we call him as a cruel king, a king who doesn't have a, a heart because he created a disaster for the people. Yeah, they tried and sure, the ladder goes up and up and up. And there was a time when they see that their ladder is high, very high. And he said, there is a ceremonial day for the people to come and gather around some on top of the, of the mountains, some on high uplands to try and witness the day when the moon is going to be brought to him. When uh, the army, very important people gather together, <laughs> they climb up the ladder. And that king has so many stories around him because he did not consult the spirits. He, doesn't, he did not want he was told by the spirits that what you want to do can never happen. Why you? How special are you for the people, for, for you to have the moon in your hands, to become a pledge for you to put your food? Why did you want to do that? If you do that, you are going to cause a disaster and a lot of people are going to die. And he did not listen. There is a space in that area in Matebeleland where there are a lot of caves, Buddha's rocks, very big Buddha's rocks. In Zimbabwe, Buddha's rocks are very common. Even if you come to my space right now, I have a lot of Buddha's rocks in my space. They're very, very tall. <laughs> it's very common in Zimbabwe. Yeah, big rocks, one on top of another. Uh, in those caves, the word of uh, certain ancestors used to come out uh, advising uh, clan leaders, chiefs, and even the kings what they are supposed and what they must do to protect the people, to make their um, people uh, have life. So he was advised. He was well advised and he was told not to do that um, um, and, and he tried his best. He tried his best not to listen to the ancestral word, I mean, I mean advice. So when he was giving the advice, he tried by all means to silence every word that go against his will. 
So, uh, the day came, then everybody was on the ladder. People were trying to witness the event or whatever was happening. And sure, the ladder broke down. And a lot of people died. And it happened. And in return from the ancestor, from the creator, the creator wanted to punish. Yea, there was a word that came from the caves and said, I'll bring other people from Limpopo to destroy you because you are not a good king. You are a cruel king, a selfish person who doesn't, uh, doesn't want other people's advice, who doesn't want to listen to the spirits. So I'm going to destroy your kingship who never, never, never exist. Up to now, the Roshi people don't have that power in Zimbabwe, even in Southern Africa. It ends the, their reign from since that time. Yeah, they have lost it. Mm. Yeah, even right now in Zimbabwe, we don't have a king. We only have key chiefs, chiefs that are appointed by the government uh, who doesn't have value because uh, in our history, uh, chiefs are only chosen by um, spirit mediums because spirits are the true, have the true facts uh, of uh, choosing somebody who's truly going to become a good chief, somebody who can look after the communities, somebody who is going to be caring. Because being a chief, you need to be a caring person, a very careful person, a person who has people at heart. Yeah, that's being a chief or being a king. So up to now, uh, the king who goes against the spirit uh, has lost the reign and also the Roshi people of the heart totem are no longer, uh, have never been given uh, that chance. It's such a great example, actually, of like one of the folk tales like you have in Zimbabwe. Exactly. It's like the taboo, but it's inside of like, it's a myth, but like it, it has so many a aspects exactly. to <laughs> it. Yeah, it is a myth, but it's a true story that happens around 1600. Yes. If you go in the history books and read about Zimbabwean history, it's true. <laughs> it happened. Yeah, it happened. And we have got names, we have got evidence, we have everything. <laughs> yeah, to tell about that history. Yeah. Oh, but thank you so much. Yeah. I think also we have to close because we have to go for next break. Sure, thank you. But thank, thank you, very you much. so much for everything again. Really. Thank you. If you guys have any questions, <laughs> we can discuss them now or when we have a drink or something else. We will come back in half an hour, 45 minutes or something with the whole team to talk a little bit more. Uh, so please just stay around, have a drink, have some food, and we will see you guys shortly. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.